Hi, my name is Bob Greenier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So, welcome to O Day Extrasensory Perception. Thank you for joining me this 6th of August 2023. I guess the first question is can you hear me? Thank you, Cosmic Dave. Hi, JT Parker, Gordon Doherty, Paul O'Neill, JT Parker. Again, <laughs> TP Sven, Julie Farrell, thank you for joining us. Uh, hi, Ken Pratt. Hi, Simeon Hein. Hi, uh, Virtu Van Fai, D2105K, and D. D, 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 D. Thank you for joining me and thank you for being patient. So, what are you looking at on the screen here? Well, um, this is my first attempt at a fully synthetic image. It actually took about four and a half hours to generate in Photoshop using their AI tool and it took a lot of work really to um, do the individual components but I got something that I wanted and the earring is actually in the shape of an ank I don't know if anyone can spot that uh, little detail there I stopped short of getting the right eye correct I thought the focus was sufficiently on the left eye that people would miss that. But the idea is that uh, it would appear that there is an intensity and some level of frustration that is required sometimes to achieve these extrasensory type effects. And we'll talk a little bit about that with Ninel Kaluniga, who we referred to in a recent presentation. And the idea that the uh, brain is some sort of plasmatic transmission receiver device, this sort of out-of-body out kind of experiences, and the kind of concept that it's almost like a little bit of a light bulb, and it it projects this field, but it projects information through things in a way that normal electromagnetics cannot. Of course, part of the inspiration is the gyrification, or I, as I often call them, the crenellations that you get on a human brain. So as you can see, the brain is... Um, how should we put this? Crenellated or gyrificated. And here we have a mid-gestation human. And you see there's very little gyrifications there. And then as it's newborn, you can see uh, a lot more. And then an adult on the left-hand side there. And this is from Wikipedia. I just reorganized the imagery so that it was a little clearer. Now, what you may or may not know is, I mean, the, 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 the assumption is that the gyrification occurs because the gray matter is only the first few millimeters of the cerebral cortex. And so to maximize the surface area, it does this gyrification process. And here is a slice through a human brain. Thank you for the person that provided it, posthumously, I assume. And you can see the gray matter here is only in this area that's gyrificated. Okay? And that is where the neurons... Uh, the human cerebral cortex is a highly folded sheet of neurons, the thickness of which varies between 1 and 4.5 millimeters. 
with an overall average of approximately 2.5 millimeters. So this is not a large area. But it's interesting that it is in this millimeter range because if we are saying that this is a transmitter and receiver, then there could be two aspects going on here that is interfacing with something. Not just the fact that it's trying to maximize the amount of gray matter that the brain has within the given volume, that it might actually be necessary for it to be like this to interact with the field or the medium through which ESP can act and it might actually be necessary for it to be around this kind of dimension in terms of thickness and that it would be a waste of brain mass to have it any thicker because it wouldn't be able to interact with the material and hopefully I will remember why I'm saying that a little bit later on. Anyway, a quote from Ben Rich, and by the way, this is another synthesized image that I produced. It was a candidate for the cover slide, but I didn't like the... I didn't, there was no frustration in it. I wanted the frustration. So Ben Rich said when he was asked how UFO, that's Unidentified Flying Objects, propulsion worked, apparently he said, let me ask you, how does extrasensory perception work? The questioner responded with, all points in time and space are connected. Rich then said, that's how it works. So, um, what do you think is something that could be connected through all of space and all points in time? What do you think that might be? What have we talked about in the past that might fit that bill? Anyone got any guesses? Fractal structures, very good. Gordon Doherty, of what? Relic Neutrino, Simeon Hein, very, very good. Okay, yes. I think between those two, we've got it at least for the speculations that I am making based on informed observation of various scientific things. Now, if anyone wants to know why I've not shaved today, that's because I have to keep my beard because I'm going to be doing some acting for a cable television program um, to earn a few extra pennies. And uh, they said I can't shave. <laughs> so that's why I haven't shaved today. So what is the fifth element. Well, the quintessence, the essence of all things in the universe. According to Aristotle, the fifth element is ether, which is the substance that fills the heavenly spheres and makes up the stars and planets. Ether is also called the divine or celestial element, as it is unchanging and incorruptible. Unlike the four earthly elements of fire, water, earth, and air. Ether is also associated with light, spirit, and life. Now, there's a lot of kind of associations uh, with spirit and quintessence and ether. These things are all kind of connected and I'm just going to get my mouse working here so I can move around a bit easier. Um, and uh, let me just play that. One of those, and possibly the most famous, as Tesla said in his weapon to end all wars, that he would create a invisible chai knees wall or a chi knees wall. The fifth element, chi. And this is a concept that originated in China, but has parallels in other cultures and traditions. It is the circulating life energy that in Chinese philosophy is thought to be 
inherent in all things. So this is within all things and throughout the cosmos and makes up the dense bodies of the galaxies, stars, moons, planets, etc. In traditional Chinese medicine, the balance of negative and positive forms of qi in the body is believed to be essential for good health. It is also related to the concept of breath, as breathing is the main way to regulate and enhance the flow of qi. Breathing is the main way to regulate and enhance the flow of qi. It is often spelt qi or ch apostrophe i and is pronounced as qi or qi. Some of the names for qi in other culture are prana. This is the Sanskrit word for the vital energy that flows through through all living beings. I repeat, through all living beings. Prana is also associated with breath, as breathing is the main way to regulate and enhance the flow of prana. Prana is a key concept in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism and yoga. Chi is the Japanese word, as spelt QI, for the life force that animates the universe. QI is similar to Chi, so Ki and Chi, but it also has some differences. For example, Ki is more closely related to the concept of Ki. <laughs> I'm probably getting this wrong. Many of you probably know how to say these words better than me, which is the energy that flows through the meridians or energy channels in the body. Qi is also influenced by the balance of yin and yang, the two opposite and complementary forces that make up everything. Qi is also influenced by the balance of yin and yang. Qi is the central concept in Shinto, Buddhism, martial arts and traditional Japanese medicine. Mana. This is the Polynesian word for the spiritual power or essence that pervades all things. Mana can be found in people, animals, plants, objects and places. Mana can also be transferred or exchanged between different entities. And some of you that may have eaten a live oyster, this is something that people say is what is going on. Mana is a core concept in many Pacific Island cultures such as Hawaiian, Maori, Samoan and Tahitian. I'm going to say this wrong, sorry. <laughs> Ruach. This is the Hebrew word for the breath or spirit of God that gives life to all creatures. Ruach can also mean wind or air. As, seen as, as it is seen as the medium through which God communicates with humans. Ruach is a fundamental concept in Judaism and Christianity. So here we have the fifth element. Many names, and these are just a selection of a huge plethora of similar concepts throughout cultures and religions around the world. This quintessence, this force, this life force, this flux of material that flows through and is in everything, whether it be considered alive or inanimate, it goes through everything. It is what drives everything in all cultures. Now, going back to Nina Kalunaga, Kalugina, rather, so. So, it's just saying there, someone who's able to do a, in the form of Ingo Swan, and I would imagine other remote viewers like Russell Targ and so forth, that are enabling them to um, go out of their body and find things at a distance. Uh, in the case of Ninel Kalugina, um, 
here are a couple of facts that came out of this video which I think we need to ponder upon. Can take two to four hours to rev up her supernormal powers. So it takes intense work to and focus to get this thing going. Her pulse races to 250 beats per minute. That is utterly bonkers. Loses up to three pounds during psychokinesis. That would imagine, you know, I'd imagine that's coming from sweat. Okay. Often had to stop due to the strain. Afterwards could not often, uh, could often not speak or see. For days afterwards, had pain in her legs, could not eat or sleep. Sign of imminent success was a hot sensation that travel, traveling up from the base of her spine up to the back of her neck and waiting there as if waiting for her to direct it. And then she directed it through her fingers and her forehead. The hot current often leaves her with a bad headache. Now, I've said this before in the past. I hadn't read this. I hadn't seen about Nina Kalugina, but when I get inspiration where I think it's uh, being a downloaded or something, it's normally within a sort of semi-sleep and awake state. My heart rate goes up, I get hot, I get sweaty. Um, uh, it, it's very, very easy for, for me to make incredible connections uh, and I cannot sleep. I have to get out of bed and it may take me several hours to calm down. In some times when I have a, a series of, you might call them epiphanies, uh, over a period of time, I, I can end up with blinding headaches, migraines, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of head pain after these processes are going. I'm not saying it's the same thing, but having seen that these comments about Ninel, I can't help but thinking that they might be related. Nina Kaluniga again. Okay. Uh, according to Soviets, uh, PK is not achieved by mind over matter, but by mind over force field. They claim to have created machines that produce magnetic and other kinds of fields that increase psychic powers, particularly telepathy and PK. When I'm reading about that, I'm kind of thinking about the Integratron, a device that's kind of in designed where you sit, in my view, in the middle of a fractal toroidal structure. And this allows something to be channeled through you in the row of the chi row, this torsional flux of something, and that you are able then to channel that and connect more through time, through space. According to Dr. Ravitz in the Yale Journal of Biology and Medicine, and this was in 1951, I believe, the action of the sun and moon also affects the body's force field. The sun and moon also affects the body's force field. Well, we know Relic neutrinos are gravitationally lensed. I'll look a little bit more and recap on some of the work of Xu Wen Zhu, which could be related to this. Dr. Sergeyev agrees the most favorable time for PK is during sunspot activity. Well, fancy that. Ninel Kaluniga could detect the color of yarns in a bag by touch alone. Again, I will refer to the work of Xu Wenju. Lingering effect after Ninel finished. Well, apparently, according to uh, people that experienced spoon bending, sometimes the metal would continue to bend after the event had occurred. So whether that's something similar, I suspect it is. Not able to perform during thunderstorms. Not able to perform during thunderstorms. What do we think a thunderstorm is? When you've got that mesocyclone or whatever and it's producing a fractal toroidal structure up there it, and it's gathering in. It's sucking in the 
let's call it prana let's call it the 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 holy spirit let's call it whatever it's sucking in depleting the area uh sorry the availability of this material uh for let's say humans um then uh uh it's not surprising she was not able to perform during a thunderstorm. I have said many times in my presentations to you that I can sense a thunderstorm and my head gets dull. In fact, twice in the UK, I predicted that my house was going to be struck by lightning and only twice and both times my house was struck by lightning. I lost a hell of a lot of very expensive equipment uh, one deck alpha and so on the first time round i just lost my my uh uh dual uh modem at the time it was just you, you know uh, an old type of modem uh, but it was expensive back then but uh, twice but i genuinely feel a deep dullness when there is a supercell around and this is completely logical to me that a thunderstorm would be sucking and accumulating this matter in and it's not available for little old me to use. I will add another data point. In Sochi in 2018, sitting at the table across from me, Alexander Shishkin was talking about his cavitator and he said, and I've mentioned this before, that when he is producing these condensed uh, solitons of relic neutrinos in his opinion, that after a while the device stops producing them and to get it to start working again he has to physically move the cavitator to a different part of the lab. I believe that the, if, if you have one of these structures it has an event horizon within which it will capture all of the evasion, available spirit, the uh, breath of life, prana, mana, whatever you like to call it and it will cohere it into these clusters therefore leaving a highly depleted area around it within this event horizon by moving it to a different part of a lab then this you know that that um uh you can then re-kickstart the process i think that's a miniature version of what is going on in a thunderstorm that i have told you before a number of times in my presentations before i ever knew about reading this which was only a couple of days ago um, that she could not perform during thunderstorms. Electrical activity in cerebral cortex in the occipital lobe of the brain would increase by 50 times its standard resting rate. 50 times its standard resting rate. That is phenomenal. In this video, it's not 250 beats per minute. It went up to 240 beats per minute. This is ballpark. In this video, the quote is four pounds of weight loss. So there is some discrepancy between these two sources. But this is a third-hand source. It actually uses the other video partly as a reference. So, lost vision, pain in spine, and sometimes was close to catching on fire. That might have been, might have been a feeling, but didn't know, you know, might not have actually been on fire. It might have just been the perception of being in, on fire. Now... Um, the last point I have here is appears in 37 CIA documents from 1960s to 1980s uh, which were declassified in uh, 2016 to 2017 so I imagine I haven't looked but I imagine that you can go and find those on the CIA's uh, portal okay so other aspects were she was able to burn through rope. Now, was it burning through rope or was it weakening the electron bonds in the polymer that they used for the experiment? And leave burn marks on other people that sometimes lasted days. Were they real burn marks from thermal heat? Did they just feel like it was hot in the same way that the irritant in a chili makes your mouth feel hot but it's not actually hot? Could it be that it was these things were going into the person's body and exploding and then or somehow interacting with their nerves or getting their nerves overexcited because they were interacting with the electron signals and then uh, feeling like it was burnt and the body then responded with a histamine reaction or some other 
Brady kind or, or um, cytokine, whatever, some, some kind of reaction that then damaged the skin a little bit or made it red or whatever. Um, and then it looked like a burn, but it wasn't necessarily a burn. Anyway, that is what is being said here. Able to alter the pH levels of water. Now, how would you do that? Well, to do that, you need to essentially uh, split it, you know, or um, ionize it in some way or, or change the cluster shape. Now, could you be changing the clusters of the water in such a way that you're capturing OH ions and then making more H available or something else? So this is very, very interesting here to me, this phenomenon. Alter the trajectory of a laser beam and move a compass needle. Then it gets a little bit freaky because when I was talking about the devices of um, Shaq Paranoff potentially being able to stop a heart, um, I had never read this and here we are saying stopped and restarted the beating of a, a heart of a frog. That is shocking to me. Then it says manipulated the pulse of other researcher to near cardiac arrest. And they had to intervene. Okay, so at this point I think it's important to just go over the observations of Xu Wenju et al. at the Department of Physics, Huazhong University. And it's interesting, Huazhong University is the first, is that the first university that replicated the superconductor technology? I don't know, this rings a bell, this Huazhong University of Science and uh, Technology. And basically what he was looking at were effects when the sun, moon and earth are aligned. Note that the best time was when there was some effects of, or rather there were effects of the moon and the sun. Well, we talked about this, but let me just show you the paper for those people that haven't seen it before. And it's here, and it is it was published uh, in 21st Century Magazine in the fall of 1999. And it's abnormal physical phenomena observed when the sun moon and earth are aligned by Professor Xu Wenzhu, Department of Physics, Huazhuang, uh, University of Science and Technology. Essentially, three factors. A brass strip, brass containing copper, which has two spin isotopes, uh, at least, uh, with strain gauges and a weight on the bottom. And this gives you um, a sideways movement. Oh, sorry. Let me just go back there. Oh no, I've got to go back and find it here. Uh, where are we? <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay. Um, so, they've got their strain gauges here and during the uh, three body alignment, there was a movement in these strain gauges. I have argued that this is because of the relic neutrino flux being lensed and either being at higher or lower density either side of the moon or the sun or whatever depending on what the, the or around the earth because of the like a three body lens manifold, uh, manifold and some refraction and uh, rare refraction under the shadow or within the lensing effect such that you have a diffusion sideways and that leads to the sideways movement as it interacts with the spin nuclei. And uh, I'd recommend this book actually. Uh, I don't get anything for it, but uh, this is Ludmilla Borisova Boldyarova, uh, A Theory of Spin Vortices and Physical Vacuum Consisting of Quantum Oscillators. Okay. Um, okay, so here we go. These are the strain curves during uh, events. Then the other one was abnormal changes in emission spectra. It is well known that spectral wavelengths of elements on the Earth have proven constant by all the tests in the past. They can be altered in the universe only by gravitational and Doppler effects. For instance, spectral wavelengths of uh, solar surface compared to those that show relative shift and blah, blah, blah. 
Basically, six different models of spectrum analyzers were placed in laboratories in different areas. They photographed the emission spectra of hydrogen, deuterium, calcium, uh, CN, uh, carbon nitride, uh, nic nickel, and titanium, and so on. The spectra photographed, we should point out, are of light source inside the laboratories, not the solar spectrum. The spectrum analyzers are of an ordinary kind. Basically, the spectrum changed, emitted back from the various elements or whatever um, during the three body alignments. Now, I think that this would speak to the ability of Nino, uh, to Nino to s detect the color of yarn in a bag. If you are emitting things that are consciously entangled with you and they are interacting with the yarn, you might be able to detect the colour and it's seeing through fingers. And apparently, I don't think she was the only person that could do this. Okay. Um, then the abnormal effect of eclipse on rate of atomic clocks. So this is for rubidium-87 and cesium-137 because these are both beta isotopes. If you had a change in the decay rate, then it must be because something is interacting to force the beta decay that would be the same as Parkhamov's understanding an inverse beta decay which would require an incoming neutrino type um, particle okay so here's some deviations based on that and the last one was crystallization of a lead tin alloy produced these uh, uh, linear crystals rather than a, uh, just a random a seemingly random array uh, when it was in a three-body alignment. Okay, so um, those are the major points where I think uh, there is some correlation to be considered. She, there was a talk about some gravitational effects, of, you know, affected by the moon and the sun. There was talk about uh, being able to sense color through her fingers and so forth. But how? How can you effectively have some sort of quantum entanglement? Well, for this, I want to expand upon what I've talked about with the work of Alexander Shishkin and his colleagues. And there's a couple of presentation links here, and the slides will all be available in the um, presentation blog at remoteview.icu. But in this presentation, I think it was last year or the year before, uh, Alexander Shishkin said, We, the authors, call these formations magnetotoro electrical clusters. These are the clusters of relic cold neutrinos. The figure shows a model of an atom in a laminar flow of ether from the work of Eugeny uh, Mikhailovich uh, Asherov. Okay, so there is a flux of ether that comes into the vortex of the embedded hidden energy within matter this magnetotoro electrical structure that is inside an atom and the atom absorbs the energy it needs to survive and gives back everything it doesn't need it only absorbs exactly what it needs now if for some reason it does get overexcited the condensed shell of this magnetotoro electrical structure expels via the electrons the excess energy back into the ether so there's this breathing going on with atoms and this is every atom that exists in the universe has the interaction with this dark matter okay so i'm going to go to the presentation i hadn't translated it before but it's the presentation that he gave here and we'll just have a quick look through that because um i think it'll clarify a, a bunch of stuff so maybe we can just show it here. Now it's a it's a poor translation. I've only done it quick. Um, okay. Don't know, don't know what happened there. No, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> okay. So here we go. A proposed model of cold transformation, uh, transformation of elements, Alexander Shishkin, the Moscow region. And is it going to let me? Oh. <laughs> 
It's going to speak some English. Now. I'm going to I'm going to set this up slightly differently. <laughs> it's it's left over from translating Russian, but it's actually still doing it. Okay, come on. I'm just going to show it in the uh, browser here. Here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, before I do that, I'll um, where's that gone? Oh dear, <laughs> what's <that's> now? <laughs> oh, my machine's frozen. I'm trying to do too much. Yep, it's frozen. Okay. Okay. And uh, before I do that, there's uh, something a little bit more I want to expand upon uh, with Xu Wenju. Um, uh, okay, so this is the diffraction I was talking about. This is the kind of like bouncing off the earth and uh, refracting around it, leading to more density here and a diffraction pattern and so forth. Um, this was what happened during the 1950s with the Foucault pendulum uh, with uh, Maurice Alai. Um, and those were the aspects that I was talking about just then. But this is where Parkamov found that this radiation could come in and be bounced off microns to millimeters, this scale of this radiation. Remember what I said about the millimeter thickness of the brain gray matter, and it could be focused onto some beta isotope. So that is where that comes from, and I can kill that presentation, get it out of the way, right? So we can buy, buy. <laughs> and then we're gonna do this. Okay, so introduction there are many models of cold transformation of elements described in numerous reviews for example in the book rotational energy the original assumption was made by Alatoly Fedorovich Kladov Kladov if you remember was the person that was awarded two patents in 1980 for heat generation systems using cavitation that produced two to seven times the input energy uh, from cavitation about the drop fusion of the nuclei uh, under the action of compression forces of the cavitating bubble. However, drop fusion of nuclei occurs without cavitation. So then they, he gives support to the model of chemical uh, transformation by uh, Parkamov. The most plausible model of the cold transformation of elements was proposed by Alexander Parkamov, arguing that the synthesis and fission of atomic nuclei occurs as a result of weak interactions involving cold neutrinos and antineutrinos for the birth of such which and which an energy of about one electron volts is sufficient such energy corresponds to the energy of a photon in the infrared range therefore the proposed hypothesis explains well the transformation of elements in a gaseous medium to explain the transformation of elements in solids Parkamov proposed a model for the production of cold neutrinos and antineutrinos as a result of inelastic collisions of particles of matter, electrons, ions, neutral atoms, during their normal thermal motion. He determined under some assumptions that the threshold for thermal generation of neutrino-antineutrino pairs by free electrons in the conductors, is a, it, that should be a thousand and that should be degrees. So that's the threshold. So that's it's not a thousand there, it's a, a thousand, you know, it should be... A thousand, uh, what do you call it? Not not like that, thousand C. <laughs> not like that. <laughs> a thousand C. There we go. Um, addition to the model of Parkamov. Can there be a cold transformation of elements in dielectrics with a band gap of more than 6 EV? The answer is yes, it can. To clarify this statement, I would like to draw an, an, the attention of the researchers to an experimental fact which few researchers pay attention to. Namely, in the surrounding space, objectively, there is a special kind of matter in the form of charge clusters, according to Ken Shoulders. Uh, <laughs> spelled like that. We, the authors, called these formations magnetotoroelectrical clusters. This is the same as Ken Shoulder's exotic vacuum objects, okay? In the environment. He is saying they are in the environment, naturally. They are ubiquitous. Static electricity, let's call them. The figure shows a model of an atom in a laminar flow of ether from the work of the guy that I was talking about earlier. 
This model of, of Corals, par, par, partially uh, Dubovic and Shishkin, is no worse than the model of Bohr or Barut. Most of the quantities calculated Corals, the mass of the proton, the constants of Avogadro, Josephson, Rydberg, Planck, White, Wien, Klitzing, um, the electric and magnetic permeability of the vacuum, the radius of the Bohr orbit to the diameter of the electron, etc., have experimental confirmation. After the loss of the nucleus, this is the important bit, after the loss of the nucleus, the toroidal vortex shell closes on itself, turning into a soliton, magnetotoroelectrical cluster. These clusters have very important properties. They have high penetrating power. They inherit the characteristics of the mother nucleus of the atom. They inherit the characteristics of the mother nucleus of the atom. Each cluster contains about 10 to the power 11 electron uh, nuclei and up to 10 to the power of 6. This is effectively from Ken Shoulder's work, iron nuclei, many protons and then helium ions. It has been experimentally established that during the explosive unpacking of the cluster, a significant part of the electrons has kinetic energy up to 10 kilo electron volts. Therefore, in the presence of magnetotoroelectrical clusters, there will be no problems in free electrons, even in dielectrics, due to the fact that the energy of the electrons borne by the cluster is large, up to 10 kilo electron volts. There will be no problems with the synthesis of neutrino-antineutrino pairs, and in the presence of a large number of ions being borne, protons and helium ions reactions will occur. Right, I'm kind of imagining that somehow Nina Kalunaga, by breathing heavily, by having her heart going at 240, 250 beats per minute, and something going on in her overall structure of her body, and maybe in her brain, but her brain is doing the focusing of this, she's able to make these clusters. Now, remember, as I will show you in a minute, the clusters do not need to be uh, visible. You can have these dark, highly penetrating clusters that Shishkin, Karol's, Dubovic, etc. are talking about. These highly penetrating clusters could come out of her fingers and interact with material. And through charge and varying where she's putting her hand, she's pulling them and pushing them and able to move these things around in, in this psychokinesis. Okay. Moreover, according to Dubovic, the cluster consists of background cold neutrinos, and that is their name for relic neutrinos. So these are neutrinos that are ubiquitous throughout the universe. It can be assumed that along with electrons and ions from clusters, cold neutrinos can also be born. So if Parkhamov is saying 1000 degrees C is enough to synthesize these relic neutrinos, sorry, these relic neutrino equivalents, these cold neutrinos and anti-neutrinos, then if you have these clusters blowing up and doing what they have shown and what shoulders saw, emitting these electrons at up to 10 kilo electron volts, when they bang into things, they can synthesize um, these relic neutrinos. Okay? According to the calculations of Corolles, magnetotoroelectrical clusters has the following characteristics. So, a lot of elementary particles. So one MTEC can have 6.93 times 10 to the 20 elementary uh, inductor uh, capacitor uh, dipoles, ether quanta. These are background cold neutrinos. Uh, MTEC consists of 7.71 .71 times 10 to the power of 10 electronic vortices. Coincides with the experimental data of Ken Shoulders. <laughs> Uh, and and mine. When unpacking the magnetotoroelectrical uh, uh, cluster, it turns into a string and drills a microcrater on the surface of the substance with a diameter of this, where A is the atomic weight of the nucleus of the atom. Coincides with his experimental data. Magnetotoroelectrical clusters have uh, a charge, but can be uh, have a charge, but can be charged with plus or minus signs. Sorry, magnetotoroelectrical clusters may not have a charge. This is observed, and this is what I'm talking about, was observed by Ken Shoulders and uh, Shishkin also, but can be charged with plus and minus signs. Coefficient K was determined by the excitations of the following atoms. At high concentrations, magnetotoroelectrical uh, clusters occupy luminescent centers like electrons, 
thereby uh, extinguishing lumin luminescence. Okay, so that, uh, that it would appear that they can uh, occupy somewhere where an electron would go in a, in, for, for instance, in a phosphor, and they by, thereby they extinguish it, the ability of luminescence. So, or something similar, they interact in a way with a, or step into the place of where electrons would be. Uh, noise in semiconductors is caused by the interaction of charged magnetotor electrical clusters with NP centers. This is what Parkamov is using to detect emissions from his uh, um, hot uh, tungsten lights. During the explosive unpacking of the cluster, soft x-rays, a light flash accompanied by a disturbance in the ultrasound and electromagnetic ranges are recorded. Magnetotor electrical clusters is actively involved in all biological processes. Magnetotor electrical clusters is actively involved in all biological processes. If you are not getting enough of these things, your biology will shut down. If you're having it sucked out of you, then you might have a heart attack. If you're having too much, you might get a headache. Just saying. And I didn't translate this one, so there we go. <laughs> we'll do, do it for now. What, what does it say? I'll just do it roughly. The born matter has a mass of about that. The potential energy, blah, blah, blah. It has been experimented to establish that MTech can lose energy in matter not only by explosive unpacking, but also in parts in the form of individual electrons and or ions. This fact is due to the cold transformation of elements by plants, microorganisms, fish, and mammals. Okay. So, uh, well, it's, it's mighty interesting. <laughs> Somehow I didn't translate it all. <laughs> Unless I have a version that I did translate. Oh, dear. Oh, uh, epic fail. <laughs> all right. Let's, let's do this now. Separately, I'd like to dwell on the experiments with low power 5 milliwatt lasers. It has been experimentally discovered that with prolonged irradiation of so solutions or solid targets with the light of a low power laser, new chemical elements appear in the, in the solution and on the surface of the targets. The author of the experiments concludes irradiation with light causes nuclear transmutation. I add to that cold transformations of elements took place again under the influence of MTEG, which have the ability to be effectively captured by a light beam. Which have the ability to be effectively captured by a light beam. What he is saying here is that if John Hutchison was synthesizing using uranite, the emissions from uranite, these charge clusters, and if he was synthesizing using a Tesla disruptive discharge or an otherwise intense spark gap, that these clusters could then be guided by the RF directed freak light onto a sample in order to cluster into that sample. Okay. And likewise, if you are generating these things in your body or you are creating an, an effective vortex, some kind of yin yang vortex within your body, you can cluster these things and emit them. And I suggest to you that you can emit them through your fingers. Ah, uh, sorry about this. I'll do it properly. <laughs> Hydrogen plays a special role, uh, according to the calculations of VK Corolls, in order for the nucleus to fall out of the shell and the shell to turn into a magnetotor electrical cluster to destroy the hydrogen atom, it will be necessary to blah, 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 blah. Um, okay, it's a, a lot less. This is this is incorrect. It's four, four to 5,000 times less energy than other elements starting with lithium. This means that the main supplier of magnetotor electrical clusters is hydrogen and its isotopes. I did translate this, sorry. The main agent of cold transformation of elements are, this is the conclusions, findings, uh, are charge clusters according to Ken Shoulders or magnetotor electrical radio, uh, clusters which are formed by atoms of matter. These clusters are special forms of matter. These structures are no longer uh, ether, but yet baryonic matter. 
Uh, hydrogen is required to improve the efficiency of cold transformation of cells. Experiments with um, these clusters with a high concentration of MTE clusters are deadly, not only for the experimenters, but also for others at, great, at a great distance from the experiments set up for the following reasons. Damage to loose tissues and capillaries and high explosiveness of the structures. Okay, I've talked about this before in some of his other work. Research in this area of knowledge should be supervised and protected based on the described model and experimental facts. I created a device for registering magnetotor electrical clusters. Since March 29, 2022, it has been operating around the clock and recording cluster activity uh, uh, imp imp impulses per minute. There is a natural background, but against this background, bursts associated with earthquakes, solar flares. There's that solar flares thing again as well as artificial sources are recorded. So solar flares affected Ninel's work, as well as artificial sources are recorded. I suggest you look at uh, uh, the charts on the x-axis, blah, blah, blah. So there's, there's some charts. I think I'm nearly done. This is the background. It'll, it'll make sense in a little while. And that's his literature. Okay, so fine. Right, we've done that. <laughs> Okay, so essentially, Alexander Shishkin is arguing that background neutrinos, relic neutrinos, are already in matter. They form a toroidal cluster or a structure, a shell in there, that is part of the way an atom interacts with the ether and maintains the spinning of the electrons and the energy states, this breathing that goes on at the atomic level. And that if you have energy over 5 electron volts, particularly in hydrogen uh, isotopes, you can, can release this hidden structure within the matter and that it can go on and accelerate electrons, capture ions, do transmutation and so forth. Okay. Now, he referenced Ken Shoulders and what Ken Shoulders said about exotic vacuum objects or electron vortices, or electron validium. They are very ubiquitous things, extremely so. So you can shuffle across this road, touch this handle, a little spark, and you will have created them. There will be little marks on that doorknob that are the witness marks that I talk about. They are just everywhere. You get out of your car, rub across your seat, snap, you've just made one. You thought they were just electric sparks. Oh yeah? Go look carefully at where it struck. Carry off that piece of stuff. Analyze it in an electron microscope. You will find all kinds of what witness marks look just exactly like. So you have a point, and this is what I'm saying. Ninel is gathering this stuff together, and she's able to produce these neutral clusters that then have passed through her matter. And in that way... I'm saying they are somehow cut entangled with her and then she's able to emit them and create these fields of these things which kind of bend to her will and she's able to move these things, right? But it, And this is all related to ESP. It's all related to the same kind of effects and you're going to see that. So Keith Fredericks did something where he replicated... And I won't go into it, but you can go and look at this la uh, link. He had some photographic film, which he pre-exposed to make it, make it very sensitive. And then in a completely uh, dark room, he touched the film with his fingers and uh, had a very strong magnet uh, with the B field perpendicular to the plane. And he created many of the types of strange radiation tracks. But he didn't have arcs coming out of his fingers. Things were just coming out. Now... I'm going to start pulling a lot of concepts together right here, right now. The Shack Paranoff Generator. I have spoken many, many times about what I'm calling and is the phase singularity. This is a thing that creates what's called a topological charge. This is the thing that is in the center of the Mobius strips in the work of Shack Paranoff. 
This is the yin. It's taking energy out. This is what Ninel was doing when she was stopping the hearts of the frog. She was absorbing energy. Okay? And when she was restarting the heart of the frog, she was projecting energy into the frog's heart. Okay? Now, what do I mean by phase singularity? I mean this. This is your Mobius strip. This is something going round the Mobius strip, and it is akin to the Penrose stair. Okay? A Mobius strip and the phase of a vortex soliton. This is the phase of a vortex soliton. Hilbert factor are isomorphic, i.e. a physical value, displacement or angle, continually increases along a closed loop and coincides exactly with the origin after a round trip. So basically, you go round this Penrose stair, this kind of Escher drawing here, and you're continuously going up, but you're still rotating around the center. This is what you do in your Mobius strip. And this is what you do in a vortex soliton. This is the phase diagram. And so you're constantly going up in your uh, phase here, but you are actually not moving, <laughs> if you know what I mean. That is what is going on in the Shaq Paranoff generator to create the phase singularity at the center. And this, my friends, is your first Boom! And I chose Lilu here saying boom in the fifth element. The fifth element is personified by Lilu, a supreme being who can activate a powerful weapon to destroy evil. Corky Goss, why is it M-Tech? It's just a bad translation from the Russian, which I haven't corrected. In all of the other translations I've done in the past, it should be C. Okay. So there we go, that's uh, the phase singularity. So here, from this paper, here, phase singularity from this 2019 paper, and we're going to look at it, it's an absolutely brilliant paper. A phase singularity with a certain topological charge is a representation of a very simple vortex soliton, yet acts as an important unit element in that more complex hydro... Uh, in, in that in more complex hydrodynamic vortices. So a vortex soliton can be a unit element in more complex hydrodynamic vortices. You're telling me. <laughs> it's a phase singularity with a certain topological charge. With chaos, attractors and turbulence can be seen as the combination of a set of various singularities. This basic description is widely applicable to air, you know, maybe with a wind hex, water, oh, I don't know, maybe with an ultra experiment, light. I've talked about liquid light and uh, the um, uh, vortex solitons being formed in light from rare fraction pulses. Electron, oh, this be an exotic vacuum object and a neutron vortex field. So let's dig into a couple of those. But first, let's look at the actual paper here. So it's it's very nice paper. Uh, if I can find it, I cannot find it. What have I done with it? <laughs> uh, not there either. Okay, give me a second. Uh, <laughs> what did I do with that? Oh, give me a sec. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay. Okay, so it's called Optical Vortices 30 Years on OEM. Uh, manipulation from topological charge and multiple uh, singularities. So um, there's a lot of uh, jargon in here, but this is where I got that um, diagram from. And so orbital angular momentum is OEM. Vortex beams uh, is something that gets produced by these things. Um, 
and you've got topological charges and stuff in there. But this is this history. There's a very, very extensive history. So I encourage people to look at this presentation and follow the history of this work in science and where it's going into applications. The singularity of topological char uh, charge, the salient properties of optical vortices are mostly related to the topological phase structure. Early in the 1970s, before optical vortices were first observed, the topological structure in the wave phase was already under study. Blah, blah, blah. You can learn a lot, but there's the diagram that I used. And here is the comments. And I think one of the nicest things is um, I scabbed this. Uh, this is a phase singularity in an electron and it's in this particular paper here and we're going to go and have a look at that. But this is a 5 micron structure apparently and this is a holographic um, reconstruction by uh, using a lithographic technique to uh, etch out stuff here and then scanning electron microscope image of a five millimeter that should be five micrometer i think phase dislocation aperture aperture made in a thinned uh, platinum foil diffraction pattern obtained in the far field of the vortex aperture when illuminated with a plane wave of 300 kilovolt electrons the pattern clearly shows the donut shaped sidebands each carrying opposite angular momentum okay so this is actually <laughs> this is creating it's a bit weird but it's creating a electron soliton uh, vortex soliton so i'm going to go to the paper now so here you have the calculated holographic reconstruction of a wave function carrying angular momentum okay that is the image that i just showed you here and up here it says the experimental proof of the angular uh, angular momentum in the sidebands but anyway this is producing a toroid and down the bottom here, um, you should just look at what it says here. Holographic OEM beams of fast electrons should allow many possible applications in fundamental and in applied physics. A possible experiment would be a variant of the Aronhoff bomb effect when creating interference between the left and right sidebands. The magnetic effect could potentially serve to create electronic tweezers holding atoms in the center of the donut-shaped beam with diameters of the order of a few atoms. And I'm wondering whether these flux loops that we saw between a yin and a yang uh, uh, structure on the lion potentially might have been caused by a structure somewhere in the material that is pr continuously producing a beam and shifting the material in those loops. Similarly, to be focused iron beam techniques, vortex beams could open new possibilities for nano patterning. The transfer of angular momentum mediated by the torque of the spiraling pointing vector can accelerate nanoparticles to a spinning rate close to centrifugal de decomposition. Hmm. Certainly revealing new in, uh, interesting physics. Superposition of the two sidebands, for example, by biprism or crystal beam splitter creates fast electrons with p-symmetry having potential applications for the study of directional bonds in electron. Anyway, the point being, why do I think this is super interesting? Because if you had impurities in your palladium that created... Uh, crystal structure defects like this or if you had diamonds in your lion experiment that were doped with nitrogen creating crystal uh, boundary defects or you had similar kind of structures formed by drawn material or by ordinary lattice defects could that be sufficient alone to create vortex solitons emitted from the surface of a material anyway that's just by by and by and there's this paper here controlling neut ne uh, neutron orbit orbital angular momentum and this is uh, creating phases of neutron flux using some um, i guess moderators of different types and combining them so this is what can happen when things go through other material they can take on some phase relationship based on uh, what happens as they go through that material so with that being said 
the key point here really is that the Shaq Paranoff generator I've been talking about this concept for a very long time and in this presentation for the first time I'm telling you exactly uh, what I've been talking about and it's that there is a phase singularity at the center of this there's a phase singularity at the center of this and there is a phase singularity at the center of a vortex soliton so that is our first boom the phase singularity okay now the second is uh, you might like to say uh, a phase singularity and I've talked about it here is at the center of this 1979 paper by Holt uh, in the NASA archives uh, which is as we discussed um, current loops fixed current loops producing a fractal toroidal structure in fact at this level just a single toroidal moment and we showed that the uh, magnetic flux line reconnections here produces a vortex in the center and that produces a phase singularity at the center and essentially what we are looking at here is a current loop current loop current loop so there's six current loops around here uh, for the propulsion di device as proposed for intergalactic travel in the NASA work and that the toroidal moment is like this okay um, except they've got six rather than uh, four in this case so that is what that is here we've only got two this is the minimum this is the minimum this is in orbital currents in copper oxide this is in copper oxide in the lion experiments a very big one and a very small one this is the symbol of remote view and you can see the torsional moment here okay so um, you only need two as a bare minimum okay now, I'm going to start bringing a lot of these concepts together in the next few slides. And the first one was in 1987, E.V. A Tale of Discovery. This is in the conclusion of his book. By some irony of fate, we may have folded back upon ourselves and now have accidentally discovered that the electron validium, or electronic vortex at this stage, as an ideal monopole oscillator. This oscillator is the perfect generator for vector and scalar potential waves without contamination from either E or B fields. These waves can be thought of as longitudinal <laughs> waves in the vacuum. Uh, they are largely undetectable by standard uh, E and B detecting means but are readily accessible to the monopole world. There appears to be an incredibly large number of useful phenomena yet to arise from using the potential effects that are not immediately accessible to the force of E and B fields. This phase-determined, force-free world will certainly be another chapter somewhere in the future. This is 1987, five years after starting studying the work of John Hutchison. He was brought in by Hal Puthoff, the guy that did this video was looking at Hal Puthoff working in To The Stars Academy uh, of Arts and Science and came across the fact that Hal Puthoff was on the team and that Hal Puthoff did the Psychic Spy program and that led him to Ninel Kalunica. So from looking at propulsion systems, he ended up looking at psychic uh, uh, phenomena. Okay? Here. Here. Electromagnetic toroidal excitations in matter and free space from 2016. This is in 2016. This is 1987. Such configurations consist of non-radiating configurations. Such configurations consist of toroidal dipole represented by a solenoid with an oscillating poloidal current and an electric dipole represented by a pair of opposite charges oscillating on the same frequency as the currents. With appropriate phase difference, and oscillation amplitudes, destructive interference takes place. The combined source does not radiate electromagnetic fields. However, the scalar and vector potentials associated with the radiation of these dipoles do not cancel, but instead propagate to the far field. Hence, a non-radiating configuration acts as a source of electromagnetic potentials, but not electromagnetic fields. The physical significance and detectability of these potentials are not established and are being actively discussed in the literature. Right, so this all stems back to Zeldovich from 1954, I think, 
and uh, his model of an anapole uh, where you have these uh, um, EM fields cancelling by the toroidal moment and the charge oscillating and this is what uh, Ken Shoulders is saying is to a degree can be the case with uh, exotic vacuum objects or electronic vortices or electron validium at that time. Now I was reminded of a video that was shared published rather on 11th of February 2022 and it was an interview between Eric Weinstein and Hal Putoff. Yes, that's that name again. And when they are discussing the physics of UFOs, this is what Eric Weinstein said. There's only one analogue. There's only one analogue that even smells vaguely like this in electromagnetism. Mag Aronhoff and Bomb argued that if you pass an electron beam around a solenoid and pass the current through it, if it was perfectly insulated, you would have no E and B fields out. That is, electric and magnetic fields outside of the solenoid. But yet, you'd get a phase shift in the electron beam as it circled. This is what's known as the holonome effect. Okay? He goes on. Imagine you have some sort of electron gun here. And you have a beam of electrons that hit the first mirror, this mirror here, so that they bounce off that mirror. You have next mirrors in the form of a diamond, boink, boink, and coming back to here. Okay, and I'm looking down on my tabletop experiment. I've got some sort of detector here. This is my detector. Okay, if I have a wire, this thing here, heavily, heavily insulated, I can imagine running a current through this wire the solenoid in the center, and the E and B fields would be dead equal to zero because of the insulator. However, when I pass current through this wire, mysteriously, the detector picks up different patterns of self-interference of the phase of the electron function. In other words, this setup can detect whether there's current passing through the wire. Despite near-perfect insulation, that... Uh, that was what was so frightening in the late 50s is that we are discovering that it wasn't the electromagnetic fields at all that were really important uh, actor in the electromagnetic story. We thought we understood electromagnetism from the time of Maxwell but clearly the electromagnetic four potential was really the main actor. So then he is asked to describe how you would represent the uh, electromagnetic four potential as a visual. And this is what he drew. The electromagnetic four potential geometrically looks like a version of the Escher staircase or the Penrose stairs. In effect, those stairs would be something like we would call them uh, horizontal subspaces. The weird feature of going around a circuit and always going up the stairs and yet never climbing in height, that would be what we would call a holomony effect due to curvature paradox. This is having a phase singularity at the center. This is what Eric Weinstein is saying is the only real option that came out of the 1950s that could explain UFO physics and a lot more besides. Boom! Bada boom! Because that's what she said next. <laughs> right, so then Hal Putoff expands upon what Eric Weinstein has just said in that statement. And he says this, and you can go way beyond that. So there are all kinds of toroidal geometries, for example, where you have no EM fields whatsoever, but you have strong vector scalar fields. And since you have no Lorentz force in the absence of EMB, then how can you detect them? Well, you can detect them by any kind of quantum detector that can detect phase shifts can detect the vector scalar potential even in the absence of fields. So there's a whole engineering approach concerning which I have two patents, by the way, and have started a new company that involves only dealing with vector and scalar potentials. What? Now, he goes on about how this process allows you to manipulate the vacuum and this gets you around the uh, Einstein restrictions that would prevent you from travelling at extremely high speeds. But in this section here, 
He says, so there are all kinds of toroidal geometries. I'm not making this up. This is literally what Hal Puthoff said. For example, where you have no EM fields whatsoever, but you have strong vector scalar fields. This is what Tom Bearden is talking about, talking to the centre of an atom without dealing with the Coulomb barrier. The charge, the electromagnetic, is irrelevant when you are creating this scalar and vector potentials that can go into the atom and deal with it directly. Okay? But I wanted to look, when I saw this, what he was talking about in his patents. And do you know what I found his patent that he's referring to, that he's making companies about? It's going to be a bit interesting, this. <laughs> Here's patent. US 584520. Patented or applied for by Harold E. Puthoff, Austin, Texas, in August the 23rd, 1993. So this has expired, my friends. This has expired. Okay. This is a communication method and apparatus with signals compri comprising of scalar and vector potentials without electromagnetic fields. What did Hal Puthoff do? He worked on the Psychic Spy Program, which was transferred to Science Applications International Incorporated in 1992. He worked with Ken Shoulders from 1982 to 1992. He did the Psychic Spy Program, and then he does a scalar and vector potential device which is a communication device well let's go and have a look what we've got here well we've got a thing that does an alternating electric field and we've got an alternating magnetic field and we come down here we come down here and one of the embodiments oh my god it's a toroidal solenoid a toroidal solenoid a first order toroidal moment generator and he has electric field generators here so that he can oscillate the toroidal moment and the uh, electric uh, field moment to create an anapole-like structure. And by varying the phase, you have phase-driven uh, process. The patent number is uh, 5845220. So, this is my... Uh, <laughs> how should we put this? This is my big bada boom. This is the guy that worked on the psychic spy program has a technology that he patented after passing that work over that is based on toroidal moments without actually discussing that. Uh, he's talking about it last year as what he is currently working on. And it's a communication technology that is able to go through rock, it's able to go through metal, it's able to go through water, and, um, you know, just like you had Ninel uh, doing things through uh, other materials, moving things through other materials. So she is, in my view, projecting particles in there. Now, I have argued that there must be something going on in the brain, in the brain of myself when I'm remote viewing, or in the uh, Ninel, or in Russell Targ, or in any Ingo Swan, or whatever, who, these people that are able to do this, um, that must be similar to this process. And... I say this because if it is doing it and we are a biological entity, then we must be able to create uh, toroidal moments. And as I showed you before, we have proven categorically through experiment that the minimum fractal toroidal moment you need is two. You need two to create a toroidal moment. That is in this paper. 
from 2011. Observation of orbital currents in CUO and this is in my view and this is in my view the manifestation of an orbital current in CUO. This is CUO, this is CUO. Okay so the minimum you need is two, the yin and the yang, the balance in the chi, in the prana. <clears throat> okay so where this gets very interesting is that after one of my presentations, I'm very sorry if I don't remember who um, sent this to me, but if you can, if it was you, put it in, in the chat and I'll record it in the Remote View blog, uh, credit you. But this was sent to me a little while back when I was talking about similar uh, aspects. And let me see if I can find it now because I might have lost it. <laughs> um, just give me a second. Okay. I almost could not believe what I was sent. But it is it is true. It is what it is. And uh, so we must have accept must have to accept it. Mysterious spiral shaped signals detected in the human brain. There are many layers to the human brain from its wrinkled exterior to its darkest depths. Scientists are trying to understand them all, but in honing in on the brain's intricate neural circuitry, they appear to have overlooked patterns of activity swirling on the surface. A team of fluid physicists from the University of Sydney in Australia and Fudan University in China discovered brain signals rippling across the brain's outermost layer, which we know of, of neural tissue, the cerebral cortex, on scans of 100 young adults' brains. Signals naturally arranged in, as spirals like vortices in a draining bathtub or whirlwinds in a, of turbulent air. In the windmills of your mind. Gaining insights into the, how the spirals are related to cognitive processes could significantly enhance our understanding of the dynamics. In that present in that interview between Weinstein and Putoff, he mentions about how um, how uh, anaesthetics shut down consciousness. I would like this research to be conducted with people that are under anaesthetic, with their consent, obviously, to see if these spiral vortices are changed in some way. I suspect they will be. And I suspect those people that exhibit telekinesis and, and uh, remote viewing will have far more significant activity at the times that they are exhibiting those psi phenomena. Gaining insights into how spirals are related to cognitive processing could significantly enhance our understanding of the dynamics of, and functions of the brain, says senior author Poulin Gong, uh, a physicist at the University of Sydney. The cortex is the wrinkled outer layer of the neuron-dense tissue that folds into two hemispheres of our brain, responsible for computing complex cognitive functions such as language and strong memories. Neuroscientists have mostly focused on the mapping brain activity from the bottom up to understand the inner workings of regions like the cortex, imaging cells to determine how they communicate as networks. In an exciting twist, the team analyzed brain imaging data collected as part of Human Connectome Project using methods most familiar to fluid physicists studying complex wave patterns in turbulent flows. Functional MRI scans produce imaging data that shows when and where the brain lights up in a burst of activity flooded with oxygenated blood. You breathe to in and out to control the chi in your body, in the prana, flooded with oxygenated blood her heart rate went up to 240 beats per minute when i'm remote viewing my heart rate and my blood my temperature uh, it, it accelerates very very high 
The spiraling patterns identified in the data resemble a kaleidoscope waves or, when simplified in directional vortices, circular pressure lines on a weather map. These spiral patterns exhibit intricate and complex dynamics moving across the brain surface while rotating around central points known as phase singularities. I thank you. Boom. Bada boom. Big bada boom. I'll show you the video and then I'll show you bits of paper. I've been trying to get this paper, but I haven't been able to get it yet. Um, let's see. Not that. We will lose the advert there and I will kill the audio. There we go. So I don't have a copyright strike. <laughs> right. Okay. I don't know what happened there. We will kill that. Okay. All right. So here we go. So you can see a phase map here that I was showing you earlier. Now your hard work in watching me earlier hopefully will pay off. <laughs> right. So here is the phase map on the left in the cortex. And here are the yin and yang vortex pairs in the main structure. Okay. And you can see them moving around. That, to me, is a thing of extreme beauty. Phase singularities, yin and yang vortices moving around in the cerebral cortex, this thin structure. Now, what is that? What is that telling us? This is how it works. It's just how it works. I've been telling you how it works for, for literally years. And then this paper comes out in the middle of June 2023 from functional MRI. What does, what does fun, go and look up functional MRI. What is that? There is a difference between the magnetic state of oxygenated blood which is magnetic uh, which is uh, diamagnetic i think and and non-oxygenated blood which is magnetic it's to do with hemoglobin and the interaction with blood now also uh, what that means is these vortices are uh, magnetic in nature and a we know that if you have a magnetic vortex you have a toroidal moment this is producing toroidal moments at the phase singularity, 100%, there are yin and yang toroidal moments in this work. Schematic illustration of spiral-like rotational wave patterns and their interactions clockwise and anticlockwise right. So left, clockwise, anticlockwise right. These are interactions between the solitons. And we know um, that in the work of Neil Crichton Gold, we do get opposites coming together and we do get similar ones coming together. Here are, maybe I can get this at a bit of higher resolution. You can hear how, see how they've mapped it and how they showed that. So when you are watching that video here, this is essentially, as far as I can work out, a good chunk of the whole brain, right? So when you look at the scale of these phase structures here, they are on the scale of the brain overall structure as I have in my title slide here and as is present in images of brain matter. Okay, so the natural clusters that come from the cosmos, the N radiation, the Parkamov radiation are in the microns to millimeters. The Gray matter is in an, on an average of 2.5 millimeters. So could we be interacting with relic neutrinos that are like sub of this wavelength? That is possible. And could we be using the toroidal moments that are demonstrated here that are at the scale of the uh, so-called crenellations on the brain moving about? And you can see them here. The vorticity this is minus two vorticity this is uh plus two vorticity these are the phase diagrams of those two things and this shows the wave structure as they're moving across but because this is using uh functional magnetic resonance imaging go and look it up it's looking at 
magnetic vortexes and if you've got a magnetic vortex the order coming through the center of that magnetic vortex is a toroidal moment this center point here the phase singularity of the magnetic vortex in the cortex of the brain is the toroidal uh, moment and I believe that that is able to interact with the field in the environment and um, uh, and you're able to cohere matter and also project thoughts through this and record memories and all of the above so I, I can't wait to get the full version of this paper and have a look at it um, maybe this, this image is quite nice as well probably um, now in this one they're talking about the story listening if I remove my mugshot story listening and then math listening right and uh, this is story answering and math answering so they are able to read these magnetic vortices in the brain when the brain is going through certain types of uh, um, cognitive processing what would happen if you shut down the consciousness would you lose all of these magnetic vortices I would probably say with a 95 degree certainty that you wouldn't see any of these vortices when consciousness is not there I would imagine the same would be occurring if you were knocked out and you were unconscious at that time and I would imagine during sleep that your uh, uh, vortices in your brain are at de minimis in these cognitive areas I would suggest that when I'm remote viewing or having a epiphany or when uh, Ninel Kalagina was uh, doing her PK or when other people are doing their PK events remember what I said about when people are doing PK you kind of have to go through this process of channeling this energy and, and getting in an intense emotional state I believe that that's what's happening here and you are a transmitter and a receiver you are a transmitter and receiver and it is a deep responsibility of which I was saying the other day when you are going into these deep emotional states you can project that information and that emotion into the far field if you're highly charismatic that can be picked up by humans as well absolutely when someone comes into a room they have a magnetic energy you know those kind of phrases they are electrifying personalities they you know they, they can hold an audience very very easily this is what I believe is going on that there are as we can see now from fact derived analysis using functional MRA there are yin and yang vortices the minimum required to create a, com a fractal toroidal pair so remember remember when we are looking at when we are looking at a toroidal moment here okay the toroidal mo there is a toroidal moment produced by this magnetic vortex magnetic vortex so a vortex and an anti vortex producing the toroidal moment so when we are looking at the brain there here and we have a vortex and an anti vortex and we have a vortex and an anti vortex or an anti vortex and a vortex that together produces a toroidal moment okay that in my view will be changing and communicating through media and this is where it gets a little bit spooky because I have warned in questioning in the past and I, I think the first person I gave my thoughts to was um, Dr. George Eagley I was very concerned of the barbaric nature of um, of uh, solitary confinement because I think that we have established that relic neutrinos and clusters thereof are used by life and condensed by them so every atom in your body interacts with the field but larger clusters of these things can be physically used uh, in processes in the body and cognitive processes okay and when you co cohere those yourself like Nina Kalagina is doing you are uh, making a larger cluster of the available clusters that are available to you 
and then you are emitting those maybe through your feet or through your fingers and they will find ground they will go into the body of the earth so there is a limited amount of these things potentially in your environment now if you had a tungsten filament light bulb a long time ago i said that if you get rid of tungsten filament light bulbs you won't have this production of this type of radiation and so like if you're living indoors in a device in a room that doesn't produce these things with closed windows then you are not available to the outside diffusion flux of these clusters and you're not available to the synthetic production from a tungsten filament light bulb so you're really in a bad place and that's why I said it was very bad during the uh, nonsense of the last several years to be locked inside because it will affect your overall life health okay so these ejected from the fingers or ground or grounded and lost so if you have an absorber nearby it will deplete those available so like if you're on a, in a metal environment or you're 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 contacting a metal bed at night or you've got a metal sink or something they will capture those out of your body and if you haven't got an environment i'm probably spelt that wrong feng shui um that is allowing for a flux if you don't open your windows every day if you don't get outside your body will be continually depleted and this is why i say it's barbaric if you have a small glazed window, uh, um, Alexander Parkamov discussed that, you know, any dense matter can reflect these relic neutrinos, okay, and presumably the larger clusters thereof. If you don't have a natural produ producer of them, and by the way, uh, he had a very large ionizer in his room when I when I visited him in 2015 doing those experiments. It's not disclosed, but uh, uh, I've mentioned it before. I thought it might be playing a role that will be producing charge clusters in the air and that might have been some reason why his experiments were uh, effective and others weren't but anyway the the point being is that um uh if if you are how should we uh you are sensitive to this like you're sensitive to um uh, electromagnetic storms to earthquakes to um you know <laughs> you're going to suffer maybe more but in a normal circumstance but um if you are trapped in solitary confinement you use the available ones in the room no more can come in in solitary confinement where you don't have the light on or or the light is an artificial light which is like maybe a not producing these things naturally you are then going to be progressively disabled from being able to connect to the akashic record and from the wider conscious field and in those instances you literally go mad you get disconnected from reality and it is insanely barbaric it's insanely barbaric to put someone into a human a human that is always wanting to be connected to other social beings that are uh, projecting this information and receiving this information and connecting even if you're not connecting ordinarily to be connected disconnected from this flux from the cosmos um and it i it, I, I would call for it to be outlawed on this basis when when better understanding is there i believe the handshake which was also uh, uh, sought to be removed from uh, human interaction and bodily contact in general was sought to be removed through these physical contacts of handshaking when you have a handshake i'm saying that these clusters that have been into your body and through your body and are somehow entangled with your body when you intend to make a connection with a third party so like first person you time you've met someone and you want to show that you want to connect with them you literally handshake and in that handshake you have an exchange of these structures that are entangled with each party it's literally a contract and i believe it's a key part of a contract in terms of you are co you're connecting with that person when you are meeting someone that you've not met for a time a long time but you're very good friends or buddies or whatever hugging them um uh, and shaking their hand depending on the na nature of the relationship or the culture that you're in that is very very important in my view to share these clusters that have come through your body and are entangled with your consciousness in terms of relation making again what they did in the last couple of years was utterly 
barbaric on a human spiritual level. And what I'm trying to get to the root of here is why scientifically that is the case. In the case of psi phenomena, you literally have the man who did the research into psi and the equivalent in the Soviet Union was Dr. Alexander Parkamov. And via doing that research in the 60s and 70s and, and 80s, he was able to develop the techniques to develop uh, experiments to prove this flux of N radiation, which he then assumed is uh, neutrino-like. That is how he did it, by running the Soviet, so, or being a key member of the Soviet spy program. It, it is in his book, Space, Earth, Human, in the fourth chapter. It's a very interesting chapter in his book. So you have two people. One came out doing Lena, uh, and, and the other one came out doing communication uh, patents straight afterwards, straight after a communication patent, and the patent is using toroidal geometries that lead to the production of uh, scalar and vector potentials as described by um, uh, Ken Shoulders in his book in 1987. That is what this pattern is showing you. This is showing you that the person that knew about remote viewing, the person that knew about remote viewing, this guy, went on, as soon as he finished that program, to develop communication technologies using, in my view, the exact basis for remote viewing for the sixth sense. Okay? For telekinesis, for all of those related effects. That is what it is. It is due to the phase singularity. It is due to exotic vacuum objects and their neutral forms, which can pass through matter, allowing Nina Kuligina uh, to do her stuff. And he, she, he starts off by talking about Ingo Swan there, a, you know, a remote viewer, ESP. And so it is not surprising and follows logically that Ben Rich is saying that essentially the mechanism by which ESP works, which is using something that connects all space and time, okay, is the mechanism by which UFOs operate. And the NASA 1979 paper that I shared in Ode Galactica is specifically using a toroidal geometry structure that has a phase singularity. The phase singularity does produce this uh, um, yin and yang process, and um, the most basic is a two-order structure, and it does produce uh, uh, this Penrose stair type structure. This is what Eric Weinstein is saying is the net effect of the Aronhoff bomb effect effectively and he doesn't mention the phase singularity but that's what it is we are talking about the same thing and so this leads you to understanding uh, where is it uh, how the brain can communicate and have these uh, extra sensory powers that have remained so clouded in mystery for time immemorial there we go so i'm going to see if you've got any questions now if you've got any specific things i want to go over um i think this uh, very clearly um explains why you need extra blood oxygen extra blood extra oxygen because the and i didn't really clarify this but as I've said many times before, it's the paramagnetic nature of oxygen which these clusters bind to, right? This is why the iron was produced in the Bokris and Sundaresen work in 1996 and not when there was nitrogen dissolved in the water. It is why you had that weird spectral glow over Chernobyl um, 
which doesn't ordinarily occur because the clusters were bound to the oxygen in the air. The reason you need to regulate your chi through the action of breathing is because the oxygen you take in from the environment has a certain amount of this uh, cluster type structures bound to the oxygen and you bring it in that then gets carried through and into your brain and the more blood pressure you have the higher uh, uh, oxygenation you have you know the more that you will be able to exhibit these uh, toroidal uh, moment generating vortex and anti-vortex magnetic structures in the brain and the more you'll be able to cohere these things and direct them once they've been and uh, in through your consciousness okay so i'm gonna see uh if you've got any questions okay okay how would these uh effects affect submarines um submariners um well firstly a submariner typically will be near a nuclear reactor the nuclear reactor would produce plenty of these structures so um i don't know whether that's an over issue um and uh you know depending on the lighting in in the submarination sub, submarine rather um you can use the technology to uh transmit to submarines Psy has been around forever. Yes, it has. Yeah. Do some buildings such as cathedrals have geometries that encourage these charged clusters to accumulate? Absolutely, 100%. I have shown this uh, already. Exactly the structure of the Christian church is the, the structure necessary to produce these things. So I will show you that to you now. Um, and it's the same way the Great Pyramid operated in my view. Uh, I've done it with the um, Vatican and the standard sort of layout of the Christian church um, here. So I will just stop that playing because it always plays. Okay, so here is the standard Christian church. Okay, and you, on you only need the standard uh, two tall fractal structure um, to build it. So you have your N minus two tours here your yin and yang you have your yin and yang at, uh, on your n minus one and this is your n it produces the disruption zone in the narthex where it extracts spiritual energy and it gives the spiritual energy from the unwashed to the washed it's a little bit of a sick machine i don't particularly like that never stand in the narthex when you are visiting a church when you're touring around somewhere get yourself somewhere up into the uh chiro uh, the center area here um or maybe into the apps these kind of this is a very peaceful area up here in the apps but uh, don't don't be here <laughs> don't be here down in the narthex okay um right highly uh, recommended michael tellinger yes i have uh I have Michael Tellinger's uh, book here. <laughs> so uh, there you go. I was interested in this book for one picture. Um, and it's a picture of a ank inside a sphere carved into ancient rock uh, in South Africa. And uh, really, that's the most interesting picture in this whole book, if I can find it. Because... Um, it's quite close to the structure of what you get in the mean square radius of the fractal toroidal structure um, as derived from multiple experiments. Um, and therefore, um, it's also showing basically how the pyramid works. I will find it in a minute. Does anyone know which page it's on? <laughs> I should have had a tab in it. I didn't expect that question. Uh, somewhere here, there's a picture. That I'd like to be able to show you, but I can't find it. Oh, come on. Hmm. It's going to be the last place I look, isn't it? Like everything. <laughs> hmm. 
So I think that like if you are in a church and you are in any part of the nave, but predominantly kind of like this area up near the front, um, I think you will have, um, <laughs> you may well have spiritual experiences. You will be, how shall we put it, closer to God because the machine of the church is generating a high flux of the spiritual matter, the prana, the chi. Oh, come on. Oh, here we go. It might be here. Where is it? There, there. No. I'm pretty sure it was here. <sighs> Hmm. Okay, I thought it was there, but it's definitely in this book, but I can't find it right now. So, and it's basically a circle with an ank in it. Uh, fairly correctly drawn, a little bit distorted. Oh, I can't find it right now. Um, <clears throat> and I'm dropping my beard on the floor. <laughs> uh. Bob, uh, you like Michael Tellinger's work. What do you think about the ice cream cone lithophone uh, hypothesis? Um, I, I think it's it's basically uh, a tool to manipulate matter that's been, um, uh, how should we put it? It's been pre-charged uh, to allow for um, uh, manipulation. Uh, I actually had. I can show you what I, I just. I brought this along today to show you what a real journal should look like. This is a real journal. <laughs> this is Wild uh, Wireless World, uh, and from January to December 1955, and it, it's absolutely wonderful. It has an introduction in here to PN semiconductors <laughs> and things like that. But this is the journal in which the main uh, colleague that worked with Joe Parr and Joe Parr found that between I think it's the uh, 10th and the 14th of December something like that you have the alignment between the center of the galaxy so-called black hole the earth and Betelgeuse and remember our Chelani experiment uh, was successful on um, uh, the started on the 12th of December so if you are wanting I think to do remote viewing or you're looking for inspiration or you are looking to do telekinesis I would suggest um, trying it on the 10th to the 14th or that that kind of area and it's this uh, phase to amplitude mod modulation by Brian D. Uh, uh, Vimani this paper here uh, phase to amplitude mod modulation and why would you want that well it base is the basis for um, a communication technology that was built by this South American for his uh, um, uh, government leader and so on now uh, obviously if you had a device that detect and th this this was the guy that anyway the point being is that if you had something that had electron phase from phase transmission through a system such as um, proposed by our one Hal Putoff here, if this was, uh, you had a detector in the receiving end that detected the, the phase relationship going on, you would want a phase uh, uh, amplitude modulation system to convert that phase into amplitude modulation to be able to provide your um, signal that you could listen to. And that is it. So that's page 183 in Wireless World, April 1955, in what I would argue is a proper journal. <laughs> Hey Bob, do you think someone without an education would be able to bring such a technology out if that person has most of it already mapped? 
or should that per uh, should that person not waste their time or waste their time? Um, uh, I I would suggest you know I wasn't ready for tonight's presentation, but uh, I I felt that the I had a compelling argument to make. I wouldn't be making it in the best way possible, but I you know sometimes you need to practice an argument, and um, the the concepts I wanted to really get across today were. Uh, explaining what I meant by phase singularities, which I've been talking about for a very long time, and the fact that they exist in all of these different things, and the fact that this is the same as Weinstein is talking about here in relationship to UFO physics, but um, that the same thing is according to uh, Hal Puthoff based on toroidal geometries, kinds of toroidal geometries for producing these um vector and scalar potential fields that can then be varied in such a way that they form a communication technology and that very simply this is the basis of his 1993 patent and then if you wrap that back into here uh, you end up with brain spirals doing exactly the same thing so it makes sense that ESP and uh, of Ingo Swan and Russell Targ and the like um, was clearly uh, when they understood it based on this toroidal moment or something that they understood it in the way that they understood it, but it is the toroidal moment, and that they were creating a technological product out of it. The scary thing is that if you created something that used the type of technology he's talking about here, and you had it in the kind of wavelengths necessary to interact with the brain matter of humans, you could literally send information into people's brains and that is called a psychotronic weapon and I have no doubt that that has been built and that is why it is necessary to educate on these matters so that people are aware of the reality and truth from a physical process and a experimental reality that this can be done so we can be aware um, that uh, you know sometimes you might have thoughts that aren't your own and uh <laughs> it really is voices in your head. <laughs> so I, I don't know whether your question was, should you bother doing what? You should just get what you know out there. Holding on to anything is, is likely to lead to ego out. That is the information lost when you die. It's just, it's you should not waste any time researching anything if you're going to keep it to yourself, basically. That's what I think. <laughs> And don't think that you think of anything, you've thought of anything special, because clearly the things that I've been discussing today are part of many, many cultures spanning a lot of time. The fifth element here is not something new. It's just not something new. You know, it's been thought of through every uh, culture you can possibly imagine. And, you know, it wouldn't be lost on cultures that there were some people that were particularly gifted at manipulating this and so it's not surprising uh you know that that uh, they thought that there was something special and um you know it's just not new whatever you think you've got it's not new and so just <laughs> get it out there <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Crypto Alchemist said, waste your time. Hi, Crypto Alchemist. <laughs> Hi, DIY Project with Chalices. Yeah, Space Case says, get the ideas out there, even if not ideal. Get them out there. Anyone can do this. Yeah, I've always learned far, far more and far faster by sharing ideas and, and you give and you get. And so, like, I'm very sorry the person that sent me this, uh, a link to the news article on on this paper, uh, wherever it was, the, the news article over here, or something similar. I, I, it wasn't necessarily this one. But, um, you know, when I re looked for it again and I saw these spiral patterns exhibit ex intricate and complex dynamics moving across the brain surface while rotating around central points no known as phase singularity, I said, yes! Boom! <laughs> there you have it. 
So, Alan Sutcliffe, is there any similarities to natural microstructures found on scarab beetle shells uh, to focus gravity waves? I will talk about uh, um, uh, scarab beetles in, in a completely different presentation. I'm, I am coming to that, but I have a lot of material gathered, uh, uh, including microscopy and, and other stuff. So we, we'll get to that. Um, we, we <laughs> I, I want, I've been wanting to nail this, this one for a long time, and I think this is basically done. ESP is done. We know how it works, or, and we know what they already knew. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean, we already knew, we now know what they they knew. <laughs> so, how important role, what role do you think crystallized structures are in terms of being able to manipulate matter with these tools? Um, <clears throat> I th I think it's incredibly important. As I said earlier. Um, it, but not just crystals like they, they were doing with the Pons and Fleischmann effect you don't see anything until you, you either you have it doped you, you don't get anything unless you have it doped uh, and and or you you need to have a high loading ratio and it might be that the high loading ratio causes um, crystal grain defects and you end up with something like this and as soon as you start getting these things you start producing toroidal clusters of electrons and then they start doing the work because we know from uh, Matsumoto ball lightning is generated uh, and we know that in crystal grain boundaries it starts consuming the the the, um, the crystals and transmuting the material well you can imagine that at a crystal grain boundary you have all kinds of different um, uh, crystal like I I inconsistencies and you know statistically you might get a whole bunch that start producing when they're emitting electrons um, uh toroidal clusters of electrons that could could maybe cluster together so this could be a potential mechanism for doing this and would explain why crystallography is so important but i'm actually when i look at this shape here i actually see something that looks a lot like brain like like if you've got these waves that are traveling over the surface you know and that, that's hence why i have this uh lady here um, if you've got them traveling over the surface, and this is, as I showed you, it's basically a, a map of the whole brain, as it were. So he here's your map of the brain with all your different bits, and so they put it into this thing here, okay? And they sh they show these things, and they are of the scale of the um, gyrifications on, on the brain. That They look like they're of the scale of that uh, when you look at this map here, this uh, phase map. Okay, and so these are essentially moving acro across the gyrifications, and it, it might be how the brain is is sending out signals and receiving signals. It, you know, it'd be interesting, like I say, to see what happens when you're asleep. Is there a certain part of the brain that keeps doing this all night, and maybe that's the upload to the Akashic record? Hi, son of Overbook. Hi, Baron Arcanus. Hi, Art Rock. I can use a hammer as a weapon or a tool. Any tool can be used as a weapon. Yes, it sure can. Nothing special, just understood in a way that others are not akin to yet. Okay. Intuitively, the lemon feels like a guidance system. The apple feels like an actuator or the interface through which guidance system navigates. I'm not sure what you're talking about there. <laughs> Um, you can smell that leather text this isn't a textbook this is an annual journal of uh, wireless world so yeah it's from January December 1955 and uh, it's a thing of wonder it really is they even have obituaries of scientists in here and you know the BBC look has these maps of uh, you know where they are sending cables underwater here. Yes, we've got them from Cornwall and we've got them from East Anglia. <laughs> and then in different parts, they've got like, they've got discussions on the interference in color TVs and the difference between the European system and, 
uh, it's 1955. I mean, it's it's crazy the kind of discussions that are going on in 1955. <laughs> Ionosphere review. <laughs> So the sections of brain is resonating with certain realities. Uh, maybe. Um, uh, I, I think I think it's just a story. It's like I, I see the Akashic Record, which is the relic neutrino condensate, as a trans-universal single wave function medium through which it, you can store information in a sense that is close to your dna that that drives your cryptographic key and then you can put your information in through your own toroidal moments i mean these toroidal moments here that are being generated by these phase singularities in the the magnetic vortex and anti vortex um will have a subtle variation in their toroidal moment up and down the 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 uh, precession angle and the precession velocity and the amplitude of all these different uh, aspects such that um, it's unique to you so you can recall your own information like I say if if there are particular areas of the brain that still function when you're asleep uh, laying down memories they may be the parts of the brain that you need to protect the most because they may be the parts of the mem brain that reconstitute memories if you have brain damage or whatever or you have a tumor and you have some gray matter removed and it needs to you know reorganize your uh raid array as it were from from the akashic record into your local storage How how is specific information extracted from the akashic record? It's the same thing. You have a D you have DNA, and your DNA is your cryptographic key, and that alters the uh, properties of the toroidal moments such that they can interact with the akashic record and, and extract your information at any point in the universe. And people in your bloodline, people that are related to you, um, or people that you've somehow connected with by giving them some of your intention to be part of your circle um, through this handshaking and sharing of the, the entanglement of matter um, would enable you to share information that way. That is why you must contact people. <laughs> we are literally machines that use this amazing uh, uh, field interaction inherent in nature that allows us to communicate but we must we must be in contact with each other <laughs> you know it and so much of the narrative right now is to avoid contact and to you know you see these happy strong families in countries like northern places of like northern italy where there is a lot of physical contact between friends between uh, family members and uh, <laughs> this is why it, it, there's there's something soulless about social media because like you might still know what your family member or friend is doing, but because you don't actually spend any physical time with them, um, you know, helping each other not fall over on a boat or whatever, the actual contact time, you don't have this interchange, this exchange of, of this coherent. Uh, um entangled matter and and so you literally lose contact you can it, it's no better than reading a a um a news report on a friend like okay well i knew that person once but they they there is no meaning to them for me um you you have to con contact people physically <laughs> So uh, I don't know what that means, but uh, Vitru Vimfi, do we feed off the sun's loosh? Um, I think when there's coronal mass ejections and sunspots, there is a different flux. The actual relic neutrino equivalent, cold neutrinos that are synthesized on the sun, don't have the velocity to escape the sun's gravitational well. This is all explained in Alexander Parkamov's book. 
So you need these coronal mass ejections or sunspot t things to project some material out uh, of the um, or of the sun. So we mostly rely on the flux from the cosmos. So crypto alchemist is voting for me to be the next head of the BBC. Uh, <laughs> have they have they sacked someone at the BBC then? <laughs> Uh, Herwoods, uh, mulberry-like and fractal crystalline calcifications were observed by scan electron microscope SEM. Some of the crystals are similar to hydroxy apatite. Others, are you talking about the? Uh, you're talking about the superconductor or so-called superconductor that looks <laughs> looks more, more like a uh, uh, a highly diamagnetic material to me at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first thing I said about it uh, that video of the, the piece on the, the magnet looks like it's diamagnetic I don't see it floating I see it being pushed away um. okay is the Akashic field like the EM phantom writ large I'd say it's the, uh, the, the, the yeah it is well the whole universe is one big EM phantom it's fractal. It's it's holographic. As above, so below. Taranoi, I wonder whether people with autism interact differently with the Akashic Record. I expect they do. In fact, I would like to see um, these kind of maps done for autists with for instance, math listening and story listening, a comparison between a bunch of autists and uh, non-autists. Uh, story answering and math answering. So, you know. So Art Rock is suggesting that access to the Akashic Record is only allowed if the intent behind accessing the information is constructive in nature. Um, uh, destructive. In, I, I think it's probably based on... Uh, the, the, there's, the, there's the access to the Akashic Record in a very specific nature where you have your rights over your bloodlines uh, and those that have allowed you access to theirs through this quantum entangled connection by sharing your their access keys with you, like their private access keys. But I would imagine if someone is taking, for instance, uh, psilocybin psilocybe, that uh, there would be a different uh, type of toroidal motions going on in here. And maybe with MDMA or some other psychoactive drugs there will be all kinds of different um vortex natures in here so th this particular study is very very fresh off the press being only published in um june the middle of june but i think there's a huge potential here for um further study under various states of mind and i expect you will see something very interesting going on in the case of um, psychedelics and stuff like that. And I think in the case of psychedelics, maybe what it does, potentially, is knock off your cryptographic key, your, your private key, to your part of the Akashic record, and it changes the toroidal up and down moment and amplitude and the precession angle and, and frequency um, such that you are accidentally tripping into uh, other people's Akashic record and other entities' Akashic records. 
uh, and you're just downloading part of their their experience. And what happens is um, you look at it, you look at the incoming information in context of your own experience and the experience of your bloodline. And so your brain then tries to make rational sense of it and you end up with <laughs> either some crazy insights or some, um, you know, um, uh, maybe some hallucina hallucinations or whatever. But it may be also that um, you're able to delve further back into your bloodline because maybe it allows these things to, uh, how should we put it, do a deeper dive into into your Akashic record. And like, if we all assume that we've come from Adama and Ava, Adam and Eve, you know, two original people, then maybe you could access all of the information going back, at least up up your genetic tree. So, um, you know, that, that might be what's going on in those instances. Thanks for your kind words, son of Overbook. Yeah, DIY Projects with Chelsea says I was adopted, but there was still a connection. Of course, there, there should be. So, uh, Vitru Van Fai says, Robert Monroe's Journeys Out of the Body book series is a must read. Many insights. Great. <clears throat> Someone is uh, giving a big up for shrooms. <laughs> I, Kathy B, thank you for your kind words. Uh, I do believe we're a family. I'd, I'd like us all to meet one day. It might be impossible because <laughs> you're literally from every part of the planet. But. Um, yeah, that would be cool. So, Harewood says, in some ways, it feels like it knocks off certain dimensions, frequencies, giving more uncluttered view of reality, uh, which to us is more confusing than the order our brains fabricated. Maybe, maybe. Psychics do this, yes. Um, uh, Bob, time to look into the work of Stuart Hammerhoff. Uh, if you haven't already, he's is is the guy that uh, okay, microtubes consciousness, microtubes and con okay, thank you, Riandathal. Yeah, I just want to say that, that like psychedelics isn't something for everyone. Uh, I had a friend who did a bit too much at one point, and uh, he ended up in an asylum for quite some time. He escaped from the asylum, and uh, he ended up crashing into very many cars, nearly killed himself and a bunch of other people. So, um, you know, it's you know, um, I'm not I'm not recommending anything. I'm just saying that I I would be interested to see what happens in these phase um, maps and the rate of production of vortex and anti-vortex structures and the distribution of them and their activity, their flux rate moving over the, the, the cerebral cortex in people that are in different cognitive states. So Bob thoughts on orgone accumulators. Well, uh, orgone, according to Shishkin, is essentially the same thing as exotic vacuum objects, as magnetotor electrical clusters, uh, as uh, um, erzions, as whatever. So uh, everything I'm discussing here is relative to orgone as well. And, and an accumulator is something that is uh, 
able to accumulate these structures and uh, metals do it lead metals do it um you know things like uh, water does it because water has oxygen in it uh, when it's got dissolved oxygen so these kind of things So crypto alchemists are saying psychedelics are what uh, known as spiritual alchemy. Um, well, like I say, it's uh, many people have said that they gave them insight, and it might be that um, the brain is too locked into particular fractal toroidal moment um, uh, sequences of thought processes. Uh, that uh, it cannot see the wood for the trees, as it were, that old phrase. And there is a lot of talk around the world of it being used potentially for supporting people with post-traumatic uh, stress disorder and for long-term depression that's not treatable by therapy or other uh, recognized therapeutics. Um, and one can imagine that like, if the brain is st stuck in a... a phase uh, motion cycle that something that comes in and knocks it off its pedestal and starts a different kind of accessing of your Akashic record or the the love that's out there in the cosmos from all of your forefathers uh, and ancestors and the universe in general this whole concept of love uh, being the key to the, um, you know, the fifth element, then love and intention, then, um, you know, uh, it might help you break out of that physical spiral that's going, literally a physical spiral that's going on in your brain. And uh, I will come back to the boom, bada boom, big bada boom, uh, of this Ukrainian Mila Jovovich, jo uh, who is an American now, where she had to be activated uh, uh, to create a powerful weapon to destroy evil. And the way she was activated, and I think this is an interesting way to start closing out tonight's presentation, by the lead male here, um, falling in love with her and it was the actual act of of showing love with sincerity and intention uh, that activated her weapon uh, to destroy evil and it's it's that intention to create to create life um, through the process of genuine love um, that you know, you're starting a cycle of good, of creating life. Sadly, obviously, the actor himself has suffered cognitive decline in recent years, and it's it's a tragedy when that happens. So, uh, Versa Graphics said, does this access to the Akashic Record mean that we are limited to the limits of our own consciousness, meaning it should have all our current biases and preconceptions? I believe that if you build friendships, genuine friendships and love connections with many, many people, and I'm not saying necessarily become promiscuous because that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about loving people i i love people i really like people um and i think by interacting with people and coming to an agreement that you want to connect then you that like i say they give you when when you have that bond that that hug the physical connection if they intend to be you to be part of their circle the actual physical connection of this matter that goes through their body and out through their fingers and and through their pointy bits um 
they can intend for you to be part of their circle. And once you've got that entangled thing as part of you, then you get access to all kinds of other information in their sphere of influence. And so I think this is, you know, this whole morphogenic field thing. It's not, not just about putting an idea out there and, and that some certain number of people come to that conclusion. I've argued that all of the people in your genetic sphere will catch on to that information and be more easy they it would be more easy for them to uh innately get that information like like a an earthworm knows to chew and poo mud and a, and a and a cow calf knows how to stand up and start chewing grass you know it didn't get go to lessons for those things um it just does it and that's what i mean is the information just comes to you it's like it's like divine inspiration it's literally that um it comes through this material that is the uh the, the process by which god which is everything is able to share information with you um and and it's it's about building communities it's 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 the love in those communities and the wanting to share and when you do that um the barriers are removed to the information that you know would otherwise be in their field of influence that's kind of how i look look at it and the more connections you make physical connections i don't mean staring at a phone and looking at words on a page and and so forth i mean you can learn information that way for sure obviously you can learn false information that way but inherent truths which are accepted as an in, as being a de facto truth and provable repeatedly they're known by many people intuitively but not everyone knows them i give the example that i didn't realize i could have a shower without washing my hair until i was 13 <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> why didn't that occur to me and like it, it just by watching and being with people you you learn things that you just never would have occurred to you necessarily <laughs> anyway that's a stupid example but you know what i mean Okay. So uh, DIY practice uh, <laughs> says I will not do that for my PTSD. Good. <laughs> we are family, <laughs> just like my brothers and me. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy B. <laughs> so Tammy says, I know someone who never functioned, <laughs> recovered from their precognizant state. He's a functioning idiot. <laughs> uh. So WP for Truth says, hey, Bolt, I built most of my coils through visions and dreams from God. Do you think I was tapping into the Akashic record? The, the, in, in my view, like... We are made in the image of this technology, which is this vortical structure, which is the root of all structures in the universe. Uh, and it's intention to form and, and share by the, I mean, it's just, it's kind of, you're introducing a unique perturbation into the wave function of the coherent condensate of the relic neutrinos through the, through the entire universe, which we may consider is an analog of the ether, right? but uh god is also the uh, the the program the ontological program of the universe and that is to create life and to explore all that life can offer and so like i think it's a good analogy the the um in in the the fifth element uh where you you know the the evil can come and it can destroy you unless you activate uh uh the the fifth element through the power of love i think it's just it, it is a it's it's probably the best part of the story in terms of how it's structured 
And I think it's a time-honored tale. Cosmic Dave says meditation is safer, albeit slower. Well, you know, this whole thing. So I just want to reiterate the points that are being made here when it comes to the fifth element. So the fifth element is basically the ether, the spirit, the quintessence. And in the chi sense, it, 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 the, it's the concept of breath as breathing is the main way to regulate, enhance the flow of chi. And in, in prana, breathing is the main way to regulate and enhance the flow of prana. Uh, and mana can also be transferred or exchanged between different entities. And it's the medium through which uh, God communicates with humans. And it's the breath or spirit God gives to li life and all creatures. It isn't breath literally as in air. But I think the ancients realized that controlling your breathing and getting the balance right is a way of introducing something that allows things to work a bit better in ye olde grey matter. And what I believe is going on is that the oxygen, uh, which is the means by which fMRI is able to show these phase singularities and these phase maps, uh, is the thing that leads to more intense vortex capability and the ability to focus attention and to save and interact with the Akashic record and your own conscious recollections and so forth. So, um, yeah, th th that's basically it. So, as the oxygen is able to capture this material from the environment, you then are able to, um, how should we put this, um, uh, interact you know, <laughs> uh, what, I, what am I trying to say? I'm getting tired now. Anyway, the the, the point being is that no oxygen, you die. <laughs> and and this might be why, like, you know, one could argue that plants are not conscious. Because <laughs> they're the other way around, you know. Yeah, I talked about the CE5 uh, protocol briefly in the um, Summoning UFOs presentation. I think it's related. Um, and you, you're you effectively kind of manifesting these things. But they, they are unidentified and they are flying and they're objects. But are, are they aliens or are they a projection of consciousness in the fractal field? So three are saying, Bob, you know all of this technology is the image face of God. Yes, I, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> it's kind, of, it's kind of the program, <laughs> like it's the omnipotent power. So Tammy's saying, Bob, would you consider that entanglement they gain from us being feasible to access from our touch screens? My fingers are very sensitive to the energy seemingly sucked from them so strongly. You know what? I hadn't thought about that, but it's a very good point. So what Tammy is saying is like when you are touching a screen, um, you know, it's act actually the... the <sighs> Tammy, that is an incredibly good point. If they aren't already doing that, I don't know why it did not occur to them, right? Because they are capacitive touch screens. They are literally based on electric field. 
Um, and uh, that would be related to the charge clusters that are emitted from your fingers. Um, there may be a way where they can interpret from that your emotions and things like that. That is, if they haven't already thought about it, it it's almost, I would say, a good chance of it being possible. Um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of concerning things about that kind of technology, really. <laughs> Very good, very good point, Tammy. So what is your thought of concept of bioplasma and connection to the neutrino? Um, well, a plasma, in whatever sense it is, is some sort of charge separation. If there's charge separation with turbulence, it will lead to the toroidal moment and not the neutrino in terms of the nuclear neutrino, which basically has very little interaction. But the relic neutrino, um, in theory, the clusters thereof can have their own and potentially even the, the relic neutrino itself can have a toroidal moment and therefore the toroidal moment you generate is able to interact with it so there we go um So Kathy B says, we all signed up for this Earth gig to be here now, to be on this YouTube channel, so it's perfect. Kathy, it is such an honor. I always say it's such an honor for you to share your time listening to my uh, thoughts and blatherings. I I feel that I've, I've been absolutely blessed and so incredibly lucky uh, to bear this burden. Um, I know I've been wrong, and I know I'll be wrong again, um, but, you know... I feel like I'm cheating the whole time because I see these things where they, it can only be that way. And then years later, like like this paper here, <laughs> they show it. And, and it's not just that they're showing these toroidal, uh, sorry, these, these vortex and anti-vortex structures. It's that it's, it's been able to be made possible by using functional MRI, which literally is looking at a magnetic vortex, which produces a toroidal moment between them, the vortex and the anti-vortex. And the functional MRI works by the oxidation and deoxygenation of blood, and oxygen is what carries the etheric matter, these um, uh, clusters, uh, as it binds to the paramagnetic nature of oxygen. It's just, it's just really bizarre. Like, you could not make it up. <laughs> the level of um, coming together of all of the observed data. Um, of course, I could still be wrong. Uh, uh, and, you know, and where I am, I would love to find out and and uh, hone the argument and, and improve on the understanding because I don't want to be deceived. I don't want anyone else to be deceived. It's pointless. <laughs> I want the answers. I don't want, I, I don't want misunderstanding. So, you know, but thank you to the person and please tell me who it was. Okay, so. So Eagle says, Bob, do you think computational modeling over Kashik field is feasible with all this knowledge, attempt attempting to understand the process by simulating a simple experiment like Ultra, but still in dark? Um, I think the best way to interact with the Akashic field and to understand the interaction with the <laughs> Akashic field is to do this research that using fMRI on real brains. I, I, you know... Uh, you're already starting with a machine that can do it, so uh, just need to understand exactly how that's happening. 
my worry is that when it is fully understood, and I, I, I think we're probably very close to understanding that, you'll have a combination of this kind of technology and electromagnetic type technologies along the lines of this, and it, it will be a means to just project thoughts and decisions into your brain. And it'll just be weaponized, and it's just terribly sad, which is why it's so important that people know the reality <laughs> that this can be done. I mean, the number of times that uh, Bearden talks about psycho psychotronic weapons here, but I still have no idea what he was talking about. Uh, I mean, uh, where we got it here? It's all over, all over. Uh <clears throat> so correct I can say since plasma shows signs of consciousness could the aurora actually be the akashic record in physical condition well it, it would be related to it i i guess um it's it's and it will have its own phase singularities um is it a conscious thing is it just a fractal representation of some conscious thing going on could you have a thousand people in norway conscious concentrate on trying to make the aura aurora borealis move in a particular way well maybe it would that would be an interesting experiment Okay, CC says, Bob, I'm learning from this neo-astrology synthetic modern form called human design. It's the only other place I've heard about neutrino flux as biology significant. P please, it's not neutrino flux, it's relic cold um, background neutrino flux. Um, not neut neutrinos from nuclear reaction type neutrinos. They basically don't interact with matter. So Shan, Shanyak is saying, I recall a moment in, in my teens being so furious that my hands became numb to everything, but an intense vibration felt like they were buried in steel left uh, on a 10 kilowatt subwoofer. Never happened before or since. Um, I think the when, when martial arts experts uh, focus their chi uh, into their hands to do like a hand chop to smash a load of tiles... I think that's kind of literally what they do. They, they end up creating a kind of a different structure on their hand such that, and with the intention, they are literally telling uh, it to cut through that um, blocks or wood or whatever it is in, in a way that doesn't harm them. It's kind of like you're telling um, the matter to, to, to bend to your will, in this case, break to your will. Um, uh, in your case, I don't know whether you intended to do something or it was just because certain things were flowing out of you that 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 it happened in the way that it happened. So WP for Truth says, hey, Bob, can AI even exist around this tech? Um, actually, a large proportion of what I'm doing to try and share this information is so that we can protect ourselves from um, these kind of devices. Uh, AI devices the something that is run on silicon uh, semiconductors as I said in the Shishkin work the NP junction is caused uh, uh, gets noise in it and breaks down what I didn't show you actually in the this is very interesting by the way I talked about how Brian Josephson was into conscious technologies and so forth and was also the emeritus professor at um, the Cavendish lab in Cambridge. Well, if you look here in uh, Puthoff's 1993 communication patent using tor toroids uh, and producing a scalar and vector potential, firstly, you can see why Aaronhoff here and these are the Aaronhoff and Bomb type discussions going on here. Aaronhoff and Bomb, Scientific American, 
uh, and so on. But you also see one Brian D. Josephson here, coupled superconductors there. And he talks a lot in here about uh, Brian Josephson as being key uh, to how this operates. And in fact, the detector that would detect so, so here we go. If either the scalar or vector potential from an external source is incident on a Josephson junction, the Josephson radiation is modulated and can be detected. That is the detector that he's talking about in that video with Eric Weinstein from last year. Thus, the Josephson effect and the Aronhoff bomb effect pr provide proof of the independent significance of the scalar and vector potentials upon which the communications technology disclosed herein is based. You cannot do this technology without the Josephson junction. Now, need I remind you the, that Brian Josephson was convinced, uh, you know, and is convinced that, uh, well, I'll just show you. Brian, I've done this before, but <laughs> I only just learned this recently. Uh, okay. Fellow of the Royal Society. Yes. Education. La, 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 la. Discovery of the Josephson effect. Quantum tunneling. So quantum computers will be messed up by this. <laughs> right? So if you have an AI that's based on quantum tunneling, uh, which in quantum effects, it will be messed up by this. Okay. Nobel Prize. Position held. Parapsychology. Early interest in transcendental med meditation. Josephine became in philosophy of mind in the late 60s, in particular in mind-body problem, telepathy, psychokinesis, and other paranormal themes. He began transcendental meditation, which is blah, blah, blah. Okay, so he's into the Tao of physics here. Producing a poster showing Josephine levitating several inches above the floor. Josephine argued that meditation could lead to mystical and scientific insights and that as a result of it, he had come to believe in a creator. There we go. There we go. So, everything is connected here. Everything is connected. <laughs> Condensed matter physics guy, won the Nobel Prize for the Josephson Junction, ends up being convinced that you know meditation and connection blah 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 and like telekinesis and 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 psi effects and so on and you have the patent in 1993 of Halaputov dependent upon the way that the Josephson junction works in order to detect the Aronhoff bomb effects produced by the scalar uh, uh, projected through uh, the uh, 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 scalar and vector potentials from a device that projects a toroidal moment with a uh, varying electric field. Um, Randall, Bob, can the ether be a non-Newtonian fluid? It's certainly a superfluid. AI is man's attempt to rewrite the Akashic Record. AI is a poor substitute for the Akashic Record because it's being trained on the... Um, it's being trained on what's published on the internet. Where it gets really scary is if we allow some people to put a probe inside our brain, either a physical one or one that is based on functional ma magnetic resonance imaging of billions of people because then you will have the AI based on AI. <laughs> well, actual intelligence, the second AI. <laughs> 
Harry was trying to uh, look at the collective energy of a crowd in a Metallica concert. Well, I bet it was fun, right? <laughs> Um, I think probably people were there to have a good time, weren't they? And that's probably the vibe you got. Taran Art, what about photon-based computing? Well, I already said in here that you can create uh, these uh, optical angular momentum. That's the whole basis behind the first part. Where is it? Yeah, no, not there. <laughs> mm, no, 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 no. Where is it? Did I have it even here? Or was it here? No, I don't know somewhere um <clears throat> yeah i was saying here that uh the phase singularity can also occur in light so you can do these things in liquid light you can create uh these toroidal moments as well so yes the, the question is, is that light actually an overlay or onto the superfluid of the ether? <laughs> like, w w what is the actual thing that's the basis, you know, the medium? So a a Eric MC lists several psychedelics being useful for resetting clearing new neural loops chaotic neural state that's kind of what i was saying earlier uh kathy b human resonance trumps ai it does absolutely um yeah ken pratt says uh, now apply hal put us patent to the bike helmet and what do we get yeah well <laughs> good question So uh, Stanchik is saying that regular martial arts and chi, fascia and tendons need to act as superconductors. Well, they are piezoelectric for this energy. So how do you get it from one to the other? That's interesting. Known as iron shirt. And it's very physically demanding to develop the body for this C Chow family, Tong Long. That's very interesting. Thanks for your contribution. So... Uh, Paul O'Neill said, could could recent uh, so-called injections that we've had, uh, potentially, if you chose to, um, or were forced to, uh, be covert use of this PK phenomena? I don't know. I don't know. Um, in in, uh, in uh, Tom Bearden's book, he talks about d disease precursors that are then triggered by electromagnetic waves. Um, it could be more like that. This might be why they keep the energy devices from those. It would lead to spiritual awakening. They could not stop. I, space case, I'm pretty sure. I think you're on the money there. I think that is that is one of the main reasons. <clears throat> it is also potentially, as I've said many times, not compatible with our life using semiconductors. And possibly also not with um, things that use uh, quantum computing. Big bada boom.
So Kathy B is talking about uh, mentally connection to a bio spaceship. <clears throat> I, I think it's very likely that because a technology for propulsion, in my view, as is argued in this video, where you must have something that breaks the, the laws of physics, man-made laws, as Ken Shoulders would say, uh, and then um, uh, Hal goes on to talk about permittivity and, and, and so on, aspects that uh, affect um, Einstein's theory that the toroidal moment can change then since this technology is based on the same kind of structures that consciousness is based on, it will mess with your consciousness or for it not to mess with your consciousness, it must be the actual flying craft must necessarily become an extension of your consciousness. Do you get it? A craft that uses this technology for it not to affect your consciousness such that you are unconscious it must necessarily become an extension of your consciousness because it uses the same toroidal moment process it uses the same toroidal moment process okay so uh this holistically explains why uh, we have to have um, the correct understanding. Now, you could have a, a situation where <clears throat> you were pre-light speed or pre-superluminal and you are running your craft um, in an ordinary way and then you set a place you want to go to and you switch on the so-called hyperdrive and the hyperdrive um, knocks your consciousness dead and you suddenly appear the next time you have a thought at your end destination. Uh, and as I've said before, I think that when you spin up these kind of structures, that there might be a place in the overall sacred geometry structure where there is no... Uh, flux of uh, relic neutrinos and for you time basically stops because there's no flow of, of of the spirit of life there's no chi through you at all and so you basically are unconscious and you, you just stop functioning um, stop aging whatever, cells don't do anything electrical signals don't do anything, it just stops so being in the right place is good. If you're in the wrong place, you, it might accelerate. <laughs> yeah, kind of suspended anima animation. So, uh, Alan Sutcliffe says, does the crypto key lose connection and have to catch up later? Absolutely, you will lose connection when you are prevented it just like um, you progressively lose connection when you were in solitary confinement. This warning that I I made here, um, solitary confinement, this barbaric uh, um, thing. Uh, when you are in a spacecraft that's using this, you will lose your ability to have your own phase singularities using this matter. And, and so you will not be able to interact with the matter and dump information to it and receive from it. Uh, I, th I think the, the passengers, so Alan, says, uh, Alan Sutcliffe says, what happens to the passengers? If they're in the right place, I think they will go into stasis or extremely slow time relative to the processes, biophysical processes uh, in their body. Yeah, Reto Oracle says suspended animation, basically, yeah. And it's suspended animation where you're not frozen. You don't have the complication of water crystals growing in your cells and smashing them up.
Well, Shan Yak says vehicle reaction time reduces to zero with brain interface. Yes and no, because I think it's something like 25 milliseconds for your brain to actually think of something. But still, um, it might be that that's in your local flux of, of relic neutrinos. Depending where you are in the machine, then you're, if you are connected to the machine consciously, correctly, then if the overall flux is much higher, then the there might be some time dilation either way. And you might end up being able to, able to make decisions in, you know, picoseconds or femtoseconds. Um, could put off device be made useful in everyday living? Yes. It would be very useful for Wi-Fi underground or in <laughs> in uh, when I say Wi-Fi communications uh, uh, in a metal box underground uh, and you know in the sea or whatever. So this this would be a mean because because there's no electromagnetic wave that you're relying on. Um, there's no interaction with ordinary matter so you'd have no losses and dissipation and you know so um and i believe because it's in my view it's encoding the information into the akashic record it's available where all of the same wave function can permeate now it might still be restricted in in the depths of the earth as it were but uh, I don't see any particular restriction across all of space. And I believe that there is no time delay. It, it's basically like you're using an entangled body of material. And so any information inserted at any point in that uh, material is available instantaneously at any point in the universe. So the a private communication with others without hacking is because you are um, using your own specific encoding onto the the um, the toroidal moment properties that can be uh, you know varied and <laughs> you, you know if I if, if I'm looking at various toroidal structures which toroidal you know multiple toroidal structures are we talking about um, are, are we talking about a toroidal structure like, uh, how should we put it, this one? You know, that's got 48 and 48. Or are we talking about this one that's got 4 and 4? Or are we talking about this one that's got uh, however many is around there, 12 or something? This one that's got 24, you know. But it, so you've got the tor and then the subtor level the numbers of each and then the subtor subtor and subtor and subtor like how many levels of in, it, it, of it's almost like you can think of this as the uh the number of bits and then you've got the sub bits and then you've got the sub sub bits and so on and and then each of those has their own toroidal moment so the fractal toroidal moment can be incredibly complex. <laughs> incredibly complex. As Hal Puthoff says, so there are all kinds of toroidal geometries, for example, where you have no EM fields whatsoever, but you have strong vector and scalar potential fields. Yeah, so Alan Sutcliffe, is, he's summing it up quite nicely or reasonably. I thought about this a lot. You have 150 paired keys to consult, uh, constitute your tribe. You have to physically give them an entangled key, but they share theirs with different people, so the group grows. Yes.
So Alchemy by Angela. So I'm not. I, I'm an hour behind the live, but uh, says that uh, he doesn't think that Eric Weinstein should be trusted. Well, I'm not talking about his multiple dimensions. Um, he's having a conversation in this video that I'm referring to here with Hal Putoff, and you know, he's only brought into this because his colleague is interested in propulsion technologies for potentially for UFOs and um, he's trying to find some reasonable explanation for that so to perform like UFOs should be doing they need to break the understood laws of physics or the accepted laws of physics and he then suggests that the Aronhoff bomb effect might be the only way to do that and he talks through what that is and and shows without calling it that the phase singularity that occurs and then Hal Putoff agrees and uh, that says that this can change the metrics of space-time uh, and that he uses this in communication technology without actually saying that. Um. Hey Bob, martial arts training gives you the ability to move faster and think faster. Could this be part of the key? I think that if, as it says here, you are adjusting your chi by uh, regulating your breathing uh, to enhance the flow of chi, or your vary your prana by regulating uh, your breathing, then you are adjusting the amount of uh, rate neutrino condensates that are going into your body which I believe will then result in changing the amount of uh, uh, or mode of the properties and interactions of these vortex anti vortex pair so you can think faster and you will have more energy and you will be able to predict outcomes faster and this is I would say this is relevant to all sportsmen. Breathing is key, even to singing. You know, I talked about how singing, you, you have to get your breathing right. Why do you have to get your breathing right? Because you have to understand how to make an inflection in your voice, how to target the pitch you're going for, how to make your mouth shape the correct shape at every moment of your singing. And it's, it's a high skill and to deliver a high skill, the machine that drives it, the brain, has to be absolutely tip-top working condition. And this is how you achieve it. So, uh, Reanderthal says, Bob, do you know a term for these toroidal moment patterns? Boojums? No, I don't. Sorry. A boojum can result from a monopole singularity in the bulk of the liquid being drawn to and then pinned on a surface. No, it's interesting, but I, I'm, you know, send me something about that. I'll be interested in seeing it. So Paul O'Neill says, T I think that's T TL Car built a fl and flew a craft that apparently affected the mind in a way similar to your descriptions. Okay, well, yeah, I, I think I'm aware of that um, with Ralph Ring, that whole sort of sequence of discussions. Um, but, you know, you, you see these people say these things and it's like it's just something they said. But given the fact that we, it's almost certain, given the evidence that we have, that it will be a toroidal moment that is driving the propulsion system and that the brain is running on this toroidal uh, system they would necessarily have to be consciously connected if they're not correctly made then you're relying on um, the machine to fly itself mechanically to drive the propulsion but you're not going to be able to if you're in the, especially if you're in the wrong place in the pl the craft, you're not going to be able to run your consciousness when you're in there.
Okay, I'm just going to do a quick review and then call it a night. Uh, thank you very much for everyone that's stuck in there waiting for me, for me and then to ask lots of excellent questions. And so, uh, basically, this was, if I can get there, my... Okay. This was Ode ESP and extensory, extrasensory perception. And I talked about the intensity and uh, energy you have to put in when doing these kind of phenomena. And the ability to project and receive from the brain might have something to do with its gyrification which increases the amount of grey matter that is available in the average 2.5 millimeter layer in the cerebral cortex and that Ben Rich the former head of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works was up when he was asked how UFO propulsion worked he said let me ask you how does extrasensory perception work the questioner are responded with all points in time and space are connected which then said that's how it works okay so it works on that basis but it's a little bit vague but what can connect everything well that is the fifth element the quintessence the ether the spirit and that there are many different names for it i gave a selection but they have similar concepts and in our field of influence we access the fifth, fifth element and control it through breathing and that has a logical consistent connection via the diamag uh, the paramagnetic nature unique of oxygen that is able to collect this matter from the environment and bring it into our bodies assuming it is in the environment you know as lo long as we've got enough of the flux coming into the air that we breathe and that it needs to be in balance and then I talked about the work of Nina Kalagina um, and this video starts with the comment that the same thing that drives Ingo Swan and probably by extension Russell Targ's work in remote viewing and other psi phenomena drives hers and that she can have fantastic changes in her biophysical state and these are necessary for her to produce the effects and she loses a lot of water during this process and is mentally and physically strained afterwards and um, often with a headache and that there are ways to enhance this process uh, using machines and one can imagine that these machines would create a higher flux of this material and I believe that fractal toroidal coils will produce a higher flux of this and if you are aware if you are you might be like to remind be reminded that Tesla used to sleep on a coil I don't know what type of coil but apparently had a, a coil under his pillow and um, one might imagine what that might be now uh, and that once these are there I argued that the integratron would be something that would allow psychic powers to be enhanced and uh, there we go and according to Dr. Ravitz and this is from 1951 I'd forgot the date in their Journal of Biology and Medicine the action of the Sun and the Moon also affects the body's uh, force field and so does sunspot activity I then talked about how she could detect color by touch and that this could be this lingering effect after she had done what she had done was unable to perform during thunderstorms and I can identify with this very well with my own uh, experience her electrical activity in the cerebral cortex where we see these things later on in the presentation goes up by 50 times the resting rate and again talk, talks of loss of vision um, pain in spine and, and feels like she's close to catching on fire um, able to burn through rope and I put that in quotes because it could just be changing the electron relationship between the molecules 
burn marks on other people this could again because she's projecting this energy into people's arms it's blowing up and it's causing pain and there is a uh, uh, physiological reaction that looks like a burn from heat but it may not it might feel like heat it might end up looking like heat but it's not heat able to alter the ph levels we discussed that and stopped and restarted the beating of a heart and a frog and i've talked about this in the past like i say when you understand what the technology is doing and how it's in all matter and it is the life force it was inevitable that a heart could be stopped i've discussed this at great length and uh, long before I knew in the last days or two that this is something that she was known to have done. Um, and I talked about how um, if you look at the work of Xu Wenzhu, it helps to explain the fact that it is neutrino based of some type and that it can change the spectral uh, l l lines of elements and that this might be a means by which she was able to detect the colour of yarns in a bag uh, through her fingers because of the relationship between the entangled uh, matter that comes out of her fingers uh, interacting with the uh, phosphor or the colour sites uh, on the chemicals in the material. I then talked about how Alexander Shishkin discusses his colleagues uh, understanding of the relationship between the ether and ordinary matter in the breathing of matter at the individual atom level and that when they are hit by a five electron volt or so char uh, uh, in unidirectional impact in the case of hydrogen isotopes they break up and form these things called magnetotorial electrical clusters and uh, uh, that these are clusters of relic neutrinos but um, they effectively become like a, a baryonic type material uh, and they are neutral or can be positive or negatively charged and they can affect transmutations and so forth and these are the exact same things as Ken Shoulders exotic vacuum objects or electron vortices or electron validium and they're ubiquitous and the easiest way to make them is a spark from your finger and it doesn't necessarily need to be a spark it can actually just be something coming out of your finger and I think Keith Fredericks although there's some debate on some strange radiation tracks which can clearly be replicated by three body abrasion interactions um, there are others that we have recorded for instance on a CCD coming from various materials uh, like uh, echo fuel that can't be explained by this and we have others like the ones on video in Henke and, and David Boutlier's experiments he replicated some of these tracks on film using his finger no sparks coming out there and then we talked and clarified the whole phase singularity thing from the yin and the yang because these are Mobius strips and this is a Mobius strip and it talks about the fact that the uh, the A, the Penrose stair, the Mobius strip and the phase of a vortex soliton are isomorphic i.e. physical value displacement angle continually increases along the closed loop and coincides exactly with the origin after a round trip okay and that was the big boom to explain what the phase singularity is and uh, that they can occur in air, water, light, electron and neutron vortex fields and it results in a topological charge and it's a representation of a simple vortex soliton yet acts as an important unit element in that more complex hydrodynamic vortices with chaos attractors and turbulence can be seen in the combination of a set of various singularities so this is talking to a fractal uh, toroidal structure and the fact that you can make a basic one using a, uh, a um, holographic reconstruction technique using lithography and that I suggested that this may be something like what is happening when you have impurities in elements in low energy nuclear reactions or crystal grain defects you end up with sites that are able to produce exotic vacuum objects in the form of toroidal clusters by nature of emitting gases or emitting uh, uh, electrons from the metal surface or at the crystal grain boundaries and then that goes on to form clusters of these things and leads to the formation of ball lightning and the fact that 
In the propulsion technology from 1979, it has a phase singularity, and these are current loops. This is actually caused, in this instance, by a laser passing through um, a nonlinear plasma. Uh, this was something that came out of 1975-1976 work and was verified very recently. Um, same kind of order of magnitude of uh, uh, magnetic fields in the structure. But that this has a phase singularity at the center, and that this is causing a toroidal moment and that the most simple one you need to create a toroidal moment is just two magnetic loops and that produces a toroidal moment as is shown here in this 19 uh, sorry 2011 paper in copper oxide and as observed in the neil gould uh, lion reactor and this is the symbol for my remote view blog that this kind of structures leads to the production of evos that they are able to mask their e and b fields and only release the scalar and vector potentials and that this is a current field of great research this is discussed as the method method that might help explain ufos because the e and b equals zero and that it is the penrose there that's the boom bada boom and that hal put off says that these are toroidal geometries for example where you have em fields what's no em fields whatsoever but you have a strong vector and scalar potential blah 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 and then i showed his paper patent here his patent where he is creating a device that's based on a toroidal solenoid just like you see in hutchison experiments wrapped around a lot of his uh, devices and um that this uh, was a patent from 1993, August the 23rd, 1993, which is shortly after handing over the reins of his uh, psychic spy program, which is communication using the brain. He's coming up with a system that is effectively, in my view, using the same scalar and vector potentials, communication methods, and that this is the boom, bada boom, big bada boom. And that knowing this, knowing this from this very recent work, and knowing that Brian Josephson is rep, is, is a person that's into this psi uh, tech, uh, approach and, and parts of nature, and that the patent here is reliant on the Josephson effect for it to be able to work and to receive signals. Uh, here uh, or someone here the josephson junction there we go it's absolutely necessary for it to work um and brian was very much into that that this work from mid-june this year 2023 shows the vortex uh anti-vortex and vortex magnetic toroidal structures produced uh, or detected by functional magnetic resonance imaging that this relies on oxygenated and non-oxygenated blood oxygen is the thing that carries the dark matter into your body for it to be used and that um, this uh, explains in my view the process of E S P. It's a real thing. It can be manipulated, it can be enhanced. It's a driver of consciousness at the basic level. It is the toroidal moment. Um and we all have this ability. Everyone has this ability. You have it. You can improve yourself. Breathing is important. Feng Shui is actually important. Uh, the structure in which you live is important. Whether you're grounded or not is important. The type of lighting you expose yourself to, the type of heating you expose yourself to. The food. Does does a microwave oven blow these things up in your food? Like that that that's a concern I've had for a long time. Like that does that cause these clusters to break up and then it's not in your food? The food is dead food. You know, does 
cobalt 60 irradiate radiation of food so that it stays living on the shelf in your supermarket for two months without decaying no bug no bacteria no yeast no mold no insect wants to touch it why is that is it because it's had all of its chi irradiate radiated out of it but i don't know maybe something to think about so uh you, there might be something to growing your own food or harvesting your own food from nature as much as you can do you are you more spiritually connected if you live off the land uh, and don't eat processed food i would argue absolutely um and there are logical reasons not woo woo reasons there are logical reasons now you can show that this toroidal moment occurs in the brain it is the basis for consciousness it is the basis for for communication technology developed by the person who looked at remote viewing <laughs> and there you go um you hone these properties you learn your breathing you can do incredible things with this beautiful spiritual machine that carries your soul around in and that love love is the secret weapon love is the thing that allows us to access the fifth element ourselves and between ourselves and those that we care for and if you love humanity if you want a better world we need to connect with the spirit with the fifth element and with the ontological will of all that is so with that i say thank you Dobronots, buenas noches, good night.